uh, the planning board planning board meeting of July 8th, uh, 2020, starting at 6:30. Uh, we'll take a roll call. Uh, Clark Brewer is present. Uh, next, um, uh, Eric Potter. Present. Okay. Uh, Amy Glassmeyer. Present. Um, Paul Grady. Present. And Paul Colary. Present. And our new newest member, Tom Callahan. Present. Okay, welcome aboard, Tom. Congratulations on uh, getting on the planning board. Thank you. <laughs> so the first the first um, item on our agenda uh, is planning board member comments. <clears throat> Does anyone have any comments? Okay, hearing none, then we'll go right to planning board reorganization. We have to um, uh, pick a chairman on an annual basis, as well as a vice chairman and a clerk. Is uh, any, are any of the, I've been chairman for five years. Are any other members of the planning board willing to chair for the next year? I thought it was a nominations process. I'm, I'm asking who's willing to, to chair. That isn't a nomination process, but I'll make a nomination if that's all right. Um, I, think that's fair. I, think, I think that's fair. I think that's a second question to Clark's first, but I it, think that's it, fair. Is, is, is anyone willing to uh, chair? I'm willing to chair. That's Amy Glassmeyer. Is someone willing to nominate um, Amy Glassmeyer for uh, chairing the planning board? I'm willing to nominate Amy. Okay. Um, then uh, we'll ask for a second for that nomination. I'll second I'll... that. Okay, Eric. Eric seconded it. Then um, I would recommend that uh, Amy Glassmeyer not vote for herself and that Paul Caleri vote on all the uh, positions on the board. Um, uh, May I ask a question on that? Yeah, go ahead. And I thought that the, the uh, board members entitled to vote. I read that. And if that's a oh, recommendation. Yeah, all board, all board members are, are entitled to vote, but we have an associate member, and I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary for Amy Glassmeyer to vote for herself. But so if Amy has to vote have, for Clark, I think she we have a we have a nomination and it's been seconded. All those in favor, starting with uh, Clark Brewer, I, uh, Eric Potter, I, okay, um, Paul Grady, I, Paul Colary, I, and Tom Callahan, I. Okay, and it's unanimous. Amy, you are the new chairman. If it's all right with you, I'll continue with um, a vice chairman. Uh, do we have any volunteers for vice chairing in the offhand chance that um, Amy Glassmeyer can't make a meeting or run a meeting? Tom, would you be willing to do that? I know you're new, uh, but Amy usually attends all the meetings. It helps because I've chaired boards before. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, would you be willing to do that? Sure. Vice chair of the planning board. Sure. Okay. And then will will someone nominate Tom Callahan for vice I chair? No, I nominate Tom Callahan for vice chair. Was that Grady? Yes, it was. Okay. And a second. I second it. That was Glassmeyer. Maybe. Maybe yeah. Okay, uh, same thing. I'd prefer that Tom didn't vote for himself uh, and our associate member vote. I'll start. Clark Brewer is aye. Uh, Paul Grady? Aye. Eric Potter? Aye. Paul Caleri? Aye. 
Amy Glassmeyer. Aye. I think it's unanimous. Okay, one more position is clerk. Uh, Paul, you have a good strong, Paul C Grady, you have a good strong sounding voice. Would you be willing to clerk on the planning board for the next year? That's reading public notices at the beginning of each meeting. By all means. Okay, then will someone nominate Paul Grady for clerk? I'll do that. Go ahead. Okay, who is that? Tom. Me. me. Okay, was it Tom or Amy? Tom, you, you nominated Paul Grady? Yes. And a second? Glassmeyer, was that you? I didn't say anything, um, but I would say that I would uh, vote for um, Paul Grady as the... Um, uh, just, just second it. You just second, second the nomination. Sorry, I, I got That's distracted fine. reading the agenda. That's fine. Okay, then we got a nomination and it's been seconded. Uh, Clark Brewer votes aye. Amy Glassmeyer votes aye. Uh, Tom Callahan vote aye. Eric Potter aye. And Paul Colleri aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Then I'll hand over the imaginary gavel to Amy Glassmeyer. You can take over as chair. Good luck. Well, thank you very much. Um, first off, I'd like to say that on behalf of everyone, and I don't think this is, um, I have to worry about saying this, is that you have done a fine job over five years. It's been a lot of work. You've had some really tough decisions to make and you've been a great leader. So now I have a uh, big set of shoes I have to fill and I look forward to the fact that I'll be calling you on a regular basis to make sure that I am actually following in your footsteps. Clark, or Eric? So, so I, uh, I, I just want to piggyback on that, Amy. Um, I think it's important for the citizens of Cohasset and for everybody on this board to know, because I'm the last remaining member from, from when I started, um, you know, just how valuable of a, of, a, of a chairman Clark has been. And I think the, the town, the citizens of Cohasset and um, everybody on the planning board really, really should applaud him and congratulate him for the, the time and effort that he's put in. You know, really, this isn't a this isn't a paying position. This is a volunteer position, Amy. Uh, you know, you I congratulate you for taking the responsibility to even go into that position. But I, I wanted to be noted that that Clark's been the chairman for, for a number of years now, not by his own choice, really, but by the fact that no one really ever wanted to volunteer and take that that role. And and Clark, I, I thank you. I've learned a lot since I started on this planning board. I think. Uh, the citizens here in town have a, a certain amount of indebtedness to you because we, we need people like you to be uh, actively involved with, with town politics and, and with, 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 with taking part in boards like this um, to make it a better place to live and a better place to, to, uh, to, to have a community and, and, and make this overall someplace where our kids can grow up. In. And, and you've done more than, than most people ever will uh, over my five years, never mind the last 20 that you've been been involved. So um, I think the planning board is, is is lucky to have you. It was was lucky to have you in chairman as a chairman. Maybe lucky to have you chairman in, in the future. And, and, and the town itself is lucky to have had you uh, be in, as involved as you've been um, throughout the years with, with making sure that the Cohasset is the place that we want to live in. And, and, and I, I don't want that to go uh, unnoticed because uh, being volunteering my time, I know what it takes just to make the meetings and knowing the time that you put in. Um, it's admirable, it's honorable, and, and and everyone's lucky to to have had you do what you've done over the years. So that's all. Oh, I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've done a good job, Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Clark for leading us in the past year and um, looking forward to the years ahead. That sounds good. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Clark. All right. Well, I have to tell you, I feel like I've just gotten myself in a rowboat um, and I, I have oars, but I could use a sail. So I uh, hope that in this first 
uh, maiden voyage in this uh, role that I um, uh, will do a good job, but I also have to say that I wasn't necessarily expecting this to happen, so I'm, um, I'm going to stutter a little bit, and I'm going to rely one more time on Clark making sure that uh, what we do and what we say is in accordance with the state of Massachusetts laws that bind us as uh, planning board members, uh, that we rely upon our staff uh, that has produced the information necessary for us to consider each of these issues, um, and that we have a lot of work to do today. And um, I'd like to see us get through the first part of it uh, so that we can get on to the public hearing, um, uh, which is scheduled for uh, 7 p.m. and I can guess that we're gonna be a little bit late for that right now. So let me first begin by asking um, uh, for us to approve the minutes. And, hey, Amy. and uh, uh, Jen, is there, is there something that we physically need to touch or see in order to pro approve minutes or will this just be us acknowledging that there are minutes to be posted and you'll be doing that. No, actually, I'm going to be sending you quite a few sets of minutes um, with everything going on. Um, I've been working on them, but we have two from before COVID and then the rest. So at our next meeting, it'll be listed so you know, and you'll be, you'll be emailed them well in advance so you could read them. All right, great. So then that will be something we take up uh, in the next time we meet. Yeah. The next topic is, are there any issues which, um, were not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of this meeting, but for which the members of the planning board uh, would like to have us um, uh, address. I have a question for Lauren. If that's okay. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> okay, fine. The, the, just to be sure. Uh, eight, sorry, Lauren. Eight James Lane. That's just off the agenda for tonight, right? Correct. We received a continuation request, so when we get to that item, we will ask if the board open and continue to a date and time certain. But they have um, that, requested that, continuation. I printed everything up in my office, and when I left the office today, I didn't bring it with me. So please, uh, I bear with me. I apologize. That's quite uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. All right. Great. Um, uh, are there any other items? of information that anyone wants to raise? All right, without that, uh, let's move on. Our regular business includes six items. Uh, they're, they're spaced at about five minutes apart and then they have a lengthy um, space uh, left at the end of the meeting to begin the consideration of the Harbor Village Business Overlay Special Permit and Site Plan Review. Um, for the citizens that are listening to this discussion, uh, we're gonna move quickly through the items uh, that we can, um, but we will not uh, short shirt the, the uh, necessary discussions that will um, hope to make it clear to people what we're working on at this point. Um, so the first item of business is a, an a and R, an approval not required under subdivision control law application. Um, and uh, number 1014, 468 King Street, 470 and 476 King Street and 44 Showfield Road. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Marabito from Ross Engineering Company. Uh, I'd like to start by congratulating you, Amy, on your new position. It'll be very interesting. <laughs> I've, I've been there. <laughs> Terrifying might be a better way of putting it. <laughs> um, this is a fairly straightforward uh, A&R. The applicant, uh, Glenn and Linda Brand, <coughs> Pardon me. on the um, uh, existing condominium at 470 and 476 uh, King Street. Uh, parcel A, which is on an abutting lot owned by a um, uh, separate property owner, has a, a driveway turnaround area. And the owner of the um, of lot one is shown on the plan, Justin uh, Walton home has agreed to convey parcel A, just 352 square feet, to the uh, condominium association that's owned by the Pratts. And in return, um, the Pratts who also own the lot at the top of the plan, lot two, 
they've created parcel B, which will be conveyed to uh, Justin uh, Walser home. And um, that's the intent of this plan to do the two parcel swaps. So what do you think the, are the implications for this? Uh, none, the uh, lots are still conforming. Um, what this simply does is it puts that parcel A, which is the turnout for the driveway to 470 and 476. It's, it, simply make, it simply puts that on the same lot as the uh, condominium as opposed to an easement. All right, well, I presume that this issue has come before the board in the past and I'd like to begin by asking Clark, do you have any comments on this? Um, well, I, I will comment that the um, the the um, the lot on the the right hand side, the two family, it is a non conforming lot by size, but it's made less non conforming by this uh, this land swap. Uh, the other two lots are conforming by area uh, and uh, frontage, so I don't. I, all three lots have frontage. They uh, appear to have access, and they um, they and two are conforming land area wise, and and one is more conforming. Those are my only comments. All right. So based on uh, past precedent, precedent, um, let let me just step back for a minute and ask: Are, are any other members of the board like to speak about this particular project? No. Nope. All right, with silence, and I will presume that um, uh, that there's no further discussion. Um, Clark, have you seen this uh, project in the past? No. All right, so there isn't any recent but precedent or issues that we have in the last uh, five years that you you can think of. Not, not on this one. It's just a relatively minor uh, land swap. Um, it's definitely not a subdivision. So I think you could ask the board to uh, vote to endorse. All right. So with that recommendation um, from Clark, I um, asked the board to endorse the uh, approval not required under the subdivision control law application ANR 1014 468 King Street, 470, 476 King Street, and 44 Schofield Road. I'll make a motion to endorse. I just have one quick question. Do on, on these uh, plans we put not a buildable parcel on them, or does it matter? Um, note six and seven indicate that parcel A and B are, are not buildable lots. And it will be combined with the respective lots shown on the plan. So they kind of like all merge together, right? Yes. <clears throat> I'll second Paul Grady's motion. All in favor, please uh, state your name and your vote. Paul Grady, aye. Eric Potter, aye. Tom Callahan, aye. Clark Brewer, aye. Amy Glassmeyer, aye. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, item. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul Grady, did you want to say something? No, I saw Lauren hand up. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Sorry, Lauren. I, you're, I've got two files up and it, sorry. There we go. Laura? All right, thank you. Um, I would just request that the board would make a motion to in, um, allow the chair to sign on behalf of the board for this vote, given the uh, complications of getting various signatures in this time. I'll make this is a practice motion. we've done before. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Um, everyone uh, vote individually, please, starting with Clark. Clark Brewer, aye. Paul Cleary. Sorry. Paul Caleri, aye. Paul Caleri wouldn't, wouldn't vote as associate member unless uh, there was a missing member. Okay, uh, uh, 
Thank you for that. Um, yep. Paul Grady. Aye. Tom Callahan. Aye. Amy Glassmeyer. Aye. All right. Item number aye. two. Um, I'm not sure exactly who to refer to about item at the 635 minute. We're um, tw almost 20 minutes behind. Other than to say that uh, we were going to engage in an informal discussion of 580 Jerusalem Road Large Home Review Update. Clark, no, recognizing that this was undertaken uh, during your time, could you uh, speak to this? Yeah, Amy called me about um, a project on the corner of Jerusalem Road and Black Rock Lane saying she thought it was too tall. She used her phone to check and she thought it was over 40 feet tall. And she asked me to take a look at it. Um, she also forwarded the plans that were on file. <clears throat> and uh, I did, I took a look at it and uh, I noticed two, two main problems with it. Uh, it's a house that's under construction. Um, one was the, the, um, the, the set of plans was, that was on file with the building department was preliminary and it had a bogus 3,418 square foot um, uh, calculation that appears to have been from another project. The actual square footage, because I put it into AutoCAD and I did uh, area takeoffs of the um, uh, square footage that would be um, relevant to a large home review, the um, residential gross floor area or RGFA. Um, and came up with 5,200 square feet. And it also looked like it was um, taller in the back. It looks like it had walk out and they raised the existing grade. So while it's hard to get to the 40 foot height, I think that um, it, there may be a problem there. So I did, uh, I did um, uh, communicate the issue with the building inspector uh, he put the, uh, a stop work order on the project and then um, told the uh, owner to submit documents required for a large home review. Apparently they're doing that and uh, presumably we'll see that uh, soon. Um, all right, that's thank all you. I have to uh, and also I have to say uh, thank you, Clark, for doing the analysis. Um, because it does take literally that level of effort in order to understand on a site-by-site -site basis what's happening. And um, it requires technical, technical skills that not everybody um, actually has. Uh, Paul Grady and then Eric Potter. This question is for my own education. Now, this didn't come up before planning, if I'm not mistaken. So how are these allowed to get through? That, and again, this is for my own education. I'm not poking a hole at anybody. I'm just curious. I'd like to know just so I could, this is for my, for me to learn. Well, it looks like it was a mistake um, okay. that the owner took a preliminary set That's of plans true. that the architect uh, of the project hadn't finished and um, either knowingly or unknowingly um, submitted them uh, to the building inspector so that uh, it appeared that the square footage was not, um, uh, was not, uh, large enough to require a large home review. Thank you, Clara. Okay, yeah. Eric, and then Tom Callahan. Oh, so that just goes to my, the point I was gonna make with uh, after Clark explained it is, is I think uh, maybe perhaps an inherent problem here is there's, there's no, uh, there's, I don't think there's any, and Karis, maybe you can help us out with this. Is there anything in place that, that, that allows us to uh, penalize or, 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 uh, put some sort of, uh, you know, financial, you know, fine on, 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 on people when these things happen. I mean, everybody makes mistakes. So we, we're, we all understand that if you have a hundred large home review applications or a hundred large home reviews that come before the town, you know, 5% or something like that, it's not going to all work out. Right. Nobody goes 10 for 10 in life or we'd all be in great shape. But, um, in situations where there there is suspected intentional, and I'm not saying it's it, this, this is the case here, it could have just been a mistake. In, in, in situations where there is a suspected misrepresentation that was intentional, is there any sort of recourse that the town could take? Uh, first of all, uh, sorry, Amy, is is uh, Madam Chair? May I answer the question? Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, 
the uh, showing intent is extremely difficult, almost impossible. So I don't think that that's worth uh, going through the time and the process. I think the point and the point of fines generally in a regulatory context is to encourage compliance. So here you have the stop work order issued and you have the applicant bringing in the correct papers, updating the papers and working to get the review done and the project in compliance. And that's really the, the best outcome and strategy that you, can, uh, that you can employ in situations like this. Where there are egregious violations and, you know, I've been here for four minutes and I'm not sure that I've heard facts about an egregious violation, um, then we could talk about other strategies, but they're gonna be very fact specific. So I don't think there's a, I don't, I'm reluctant to tell you that there's a general rule about that because it really is gonna be fact dependent. And, and just, to, and I'll let, I'll let Tom go after that, but just to, just to, just to uh, say that, that unlike the zoning board, right, the building inspector, I believe if there's a zoning violation, that, that, that there's recourse, or you, you have to force someone to comply to come into zoning. This is more of a review where it's not the same as compliance with the zoning bylaws. So if the house is still compliant, maybe it's a little, it, it, it kind of takes away some of the power that the town may have to uh, drop the hammer on someone, I guess, right? I would have to actually take a look at the large home review uh, bylaw to actually answer that question accurately right now. Okay. All right, so um, Tom Callahan, then Clark Brewer, I'm gonna call on you. And then Jen has a, uh, a request too. Um, Tom? All right. I, I was going to ask if we have a fine procedure and um, I'm just quickly trying to glance through the bylaw if we do. <clears throat> Tom, you might have to turn off your video for That's us to be able to hear you. Process. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? We can, yes we can. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to ask if there was a fine procedure here. I'm just quickly glancing through the bylaw since this is a site plan review about whether there is. I'm not finding a quick answer, but um, I would take a much more skeptical view that this was an innocent mistake. Um, you just don't casually submit plans for another project. Um, this happened to us on the Conservation Commission years ago, and we did find the person for it. We had a fine procedure. Um, I'm glad that a stop work order was put in place, but um, you know, if we, if we do not have a fine process for violations of the bylaw, then we ought to consider putting one in as quickly as possible, uh, because that is an incentive as well that works. And I. I cannot believe that any professional or any applicant did this by mistake. Uh, so I'm going to be a lot more skeptical about this. But uh, I also think it, again, what, what, what is our process for following up on these things on a daily basis? Uh, are, are, you know, somebody comes in, asks for a building permit, gets it. Is, is there any inspection going on of what's actually being put up? You know, it shouldn't be for a volunteer board member who casually happens to find it walking by. Um, I, I, you know, it's just an ongoing, it's been an ongoing issue and we need, you know, of enforcement and we need to address it at some point. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Clark, I'd like to ask you, you yeah. are intimately familiar with this uh, uh, bylaw. Well, just, just, just a couple of comments. We did uh, change the bylaw to allow, um, conditions to our decision uh, uh, after review. Uh, so um, I think that there's a possibility to um, get some mitigation from the from the, the owner developer relative to what they've done. But the real risk, I think there's two risks. One, he's got a building under construction that's, that's got a stop work order, which means uh, a, a financial burden to the to the owner developer and the, but the real risk is if the height um, um, is determined that it's non-conforming height wise, <clears throat> there's no variances that are given. There was no hardship 
uh, for this case. So I think that the, there's a there's a lot of risk on the part of of the owner developer just on the height issue. I checked out some of the other zoning uh, issues relative to the, the application, but the 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 big thing um, we we asked for in the zoning update was a certification from a design professional, basically a letter with a stamp that's signed that says, I certify that this is the square footage of this project. Not like, not uh, some preliminary set of drawings from, from a draftsman or anything else. You, a draftsman can design a house, but a, a registered professional would be loath to misrepresent um, or the thinking was they would be loath to misrepresent um, a ro residential gross floor area, put it in writing and stamp it. Uh, and unfortunately, no certification was provided to the building inspector. The building inspector didn't didn't re require it. So I think that's that's where this one fell down. Yeah, where that's there, an issue. there may be other ones. There may be other ones out there. I think that you know we all have to be aware of the of that possibility, and uh, keep our eyes and ears open. But um, maybe send a letter to to the building inspector to make sure that he requires any any anything that even seems like it's close to a large home that uh, he get a certification from the professional. All right, um, thank you for that, Clark. I want to recognize Jen, then Tom, and then I'd like to make a final statement and have us move on. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations. Um, I wanted to let you know um, an update on the lar on um, the application process for the large home review in response to this, and also um, that I met with the building inspector. Um, he could not be here tonight because originally this was not on the agenda and he did have a conflict. Um, the building inspector, um, ha as you know, did a seized work order, also met with the um, architect and both take onus on this. The one, sh the front sheet on the top was not certified. It was not correct. And they will address that. Um, I believe we'll be hearing them on August 5th. Um, there was a mistake made, intentional or not. It, it, it doesn't pass a sniff test and we know this. To address it, um, just what Clark was saying, I worked with our, uh, we went to electronic permitting in 2018 and we've slowly been revamping it as we learn the quirks in it and what we can do. We take all applications essentially through the building department um, electronically. This did not come electronically, but going forward, any new single or um, two family home, any new construction will be required that they won't be able to process their application without uploading certified uh, numbers of the RGFA. Um, into the application. So they won't even be able to go into the next step without providing what Clark is uh, mentioning. And so we've, that's been taking programming. It took me a couple of weeks with them, but we've, we've got a process that we'll be testing in the next couple of weeks to make sure that issue, they cannot be issued or signed off until we have that paper. That's, uh, that's, that's great to hear, Jen. And um, when you, this is uh, uh, locked down, so you feel comfortable to show it to us, I'd appreciate it being presented to us uh, as a board so that we understand exactly what you are capable of doing, what we can anticipate going forward. Absolutely. Uh, Tom and then Paul, and I really want to wrap this up. I just have a question for Jen. No, no, I, uh, Tom, Tom first and then oh, Paul. Sorry, Tom. Um, I'm not sure. My video is off. Um, I just want to make the observation that the site plan review will do have a penalty provision, 12.2K. Um, and I would just suggest to you that assessing a penalty for a violation doesn't turn on intent. But that's all I'll say. I just want you to know that it's in the bio. Great. Okay, Paul Grady. No, I, have, I have a question for Jen about what she just explained about that new ruling. Jen, does that pertain to anything that's noticed? Like there's a house going up on James Lane that didn't come up in front of the planning board. That's if it's not if it's not 40 feet tall, then I'm. No, this is square footage uh, that would trigger the large home review. So what okay. we're trying to do is capture, and we have had. I know that we this is this, but we have had a great increase since um, the planning board. Oh, I'm sorry, Amy, I should have asked you if I could answer that. Um, if they, um, we've been capturing a lot more large home reviews, but this will capture any new construction. And then beyond that, I'm also going to edit it so it will um, trigger something when they add an addition. So if that goes over the 30, 
the 34, but we always have to remember the 10% on the lot as well. So we will, you know, that will have to be a manual review regarding the lot size, but but the RGFA is, is key and, and that needs a change that I think has been a long time coming and we have, um, have a good program with this new online e-permitting. So this, we're gonna take advantage of that. And if I may, Madam Chairman, I just wanted to mention a technical item that there is something wrong with Facebook and so we cannot link live. So, um, but this will be re replayed on uh, 143 TV at a later date. Great, great. Okay. Jen, do, Jen, do you say madam or do you say madam? How, how do you do it? I say madam. Uh, madam, that, that, that's pretty eloquent, I like that. That's, that, like that. that's pretty fancy for some uh, say tomato yeah, I know. or tomato. I mean, you could go all I know, I, yeah. I know, I say route. I don't know, some people say route, you know. You so gotta... let, me, let me say the following, which is, I would like to propose that after this new program has been initiated, that we do an audit of its effectiveness six months from its uh, maiden voyage to determine the extent to which it's working. And if it's working, that's wonderful. If it's not working, then I would request that we consider reviewing the large home review. There have been recommendations for possible changes in um, various ways to characterize a large home review. And uh, I would just say six months out after it's, it's operating and everybody feels comfortable with it, I think we should take a look and see um, whether or not there needs to be tweaks to the actual bylaw itself. But I will leave that as a final um, uh, you know, comment. Um, uh, any other for comments on this item? All right, then let's move on. Um, I have to say that, that in the flurry of all the emails about um, our board agenda that's changed, I have this nagging feeling that I might have a version that's not the very last one. And so I wanna, if I have made a mistake, uh, either Jen or Lauren, would you please correct me? Hello, Amy. Uh, you are on the correct agenda. There was two versions, one previous and one that was revised and you appear to be following the revised as I can see. Okay, although okay. I see that I, I still have the scenic road bylaw listed here as an item and I know that we've moved that, correct? So, so let me just make sure that we have, uh, we have two public hearings um, uh, and uh, an informal discussion, uh, uh, which is a review of public hearing process with a special counsel. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so I, can I make a decision to move the informal discussion to above the discussion of the public hearings? Or I guess I can't because it's a time discussion, though we're way off. It just seemed like if we're gonna have a discussion about uh, appropriate practice, it might make sense before we take on the two public hearings. May I respond? Yes, you may. Certainly, um, so thank you. I, whichever order you prefer, um, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we, can, we can move that up. I believe Karis is prepared to speak to that. I will also just note that this public hearing that is next for 8 James Lane and 2 Pleasant Street, we did receive a request from the applicant to be continued to our August meeting. So this would just be an open and continuation to a time certain. So there will be no deliberation on this. Okay, great. So, so essentially then we're just staying in the, in the same order and I would uh, ask that, um, uh, um, that uh, Karis, um, our, our legal counsel, uh, proceed. But before we do that, I would like to um, just acknowledge uh, Eve Tepper, who is here to support the planning board during the process of the um, Cohasset Harbor Village business overlay. And uh, she will be with us and, and is a resource for all of us um, going forward. Uh, um, Clark? Yeah, we need to um, we need to vote to continue the uh, A. James Lane. Let's get that out of the way. All right. Um, uh, then, uh, Paul, are you ready to, do, do, does he need to read it first and then? Um, no, no, it's, it? it's a continued, it's continued. It's okay, just, so we're going to continue it again. All right. So would someone like to make a motion to continue the public so hearing? Moved. Seconded. Uh, please vote saying your name first. Clark Brewer, aye. Paul Grady, aye. 
I'm Callahan, I. Eric Potter, I. Amy Glassmeyer, I. Uh, Lauren? Um, I, just to clarify, just did you intend to make a motion? We did not specify a date and time, so I would um, recommend to the board that you mo motion to continue this hearing to August 5th at 6.45 p.m. All right, so All right. back again for a motion to continue the public hearing on 8 James Lane to Pleasant Street to August, did you say 5th? Yes. August 5th, do we have a time? 6.45 p.m. 45 p.m. Um, may I get a vote from the board? Uh, beginning with Paul Grady. Uh, aye. Tom Callanan. Tom Callahan, aye. Clark Brewer. Aye. Eric Potter. Aye. Amy Glassmeyer, aye. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for the uh, technical assist. Um, all right, then let's move on. Me, Amy, uh, Clark? Amy, on, on that one, uh, I would say if, if they're not prepared uh, for that next hearing, we should and want to continue again since that would be a third time, or maybe fourth, maybe even fifth, I think that the applicant should withdraw without prejudice or, or else if we open the public hearing, instead of continuing, we could just, uh, we could just vote on it. All right, does that require anything more than a statement of fact at this moment? No, I think that Lauren can advise us when we get close to the meeting. All right. Great. So everybody be prepared for that. Um, all we right. Do you agree to that, Amy? I agree with Clark's assessment wholeheartedly. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that as well. And um, just one more of those things I have to learn. Um, I have a wise one to, to help. Um, okay, so the informal discussion, let me just say something about the informal discussion on the Scenic Rose Bylaw. A citizen emailed me, I forwarded it to Lauren. There was a request to, uh, with a, an exhibit that indicated that there was a, what uh, the citizen felt was a non-compliance with the Scenic Roads Bylaw. And this individual would like to come before us and talk about the um, ways in which that law is, or that bylaw is implemented and issues that um, seem to be uh, arising in uh, her neighborhood. So we will see that um, the next time we meet, I believe. All right, let's move on. Um, so we will now have a discussion reviewing of public hearing process with special counsel, please. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, uh, board members. Uh, in preparation for the, um, the hearing that we're doing later this afternoon, um, uh, former chair, Mr. Brewer, Ms. Lynn, asked me just to um, give you a little bit of a primer of an overview of um, how to conduct the public hearing, um, particularly with respect to a, a, a complicated uh, uh, land use issue like uh, the one that is before us. Um, and, and just as sort of a reminder, we in our last meeting, we talked about uh, the legal standards, the applicable legal standards and timeframes, and you have a memo on that. Um, and then really wanted to sort of talk about this time. Um, you know, this is obviously uh, an applicant coming before you for discretionary land use approval. Um, and uh, you're gonna be focusing on um, the uh, application, which is filed under the Harbor Village Business Overlay District, which set forth specific standards uh, and written findings that you ultimately have to make with respect to this application. and. Uh, I know that in your packets there is um, commentary and analysis from staff that goes through the, those specific um, points and, and uh, lays out where you're going to need to make a decision uh, and where you may need more information. So I, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the public hearing. As you know, um, you know, a chair opens a public hearing consistent with the published time for the hearing. Um, the applicant then projects, uh, presents the project, um, and then in an orderly fashion, and you know, particularly uh, in the context of uh, Zoom meetings and and uh, video conferences, uh, orderly means you know 
waiting uh, as much as possible for the chair to recognize you and, and finding a way to be recognized. Um, the, uh, the planning board members can ask questions and make comments. That typically happens first. Uh, attendees uh, provide comments. And then uh, the applicant can be given the opportunity to respond to those comments and answer additional questions from the planning board members. Um, there may be questions that can't be answered and, and they can be scheduled uh, to be uh, responded to at the, the next meeting. Um, you know, for complex projects like this, public hearing is typically divided into multiple sessions. You're not gonna take on all of the substantive issues in one meeting. And uh, I know that Lauren has laid out a, a hearing schedule for you so that you and the applicant uh, are on notice as to what subjects will be covered in each meeting. That's helpful for you so that you, you know, can prepare on those particular issues and also go back and look at those sections of the bylaw. You can ask questions of staff or council. We're all part of your resources uh, to assist you in this process. And then um, uh, you then have the hearing and then it also assists the applicant because they will have the right people available for you to answer the, the correct the questions that you may have on those particular issues. Um, as we've, we've talked about, um, uh, a special permit requires a vote of four members of a five member board um, and then uh, needs to have a detailed record, uh, the, the written decision, a detailed record of, of the decision and all of the standards that apply. Uh, in this case, um, uh, 90 days uh, from the date the public hearing is closed, uh, the written decision has to be issued. You are also doing a site plan review at the same time. It is a joint application. The special permit deadlines apply, uh, but you also have to look at the site plan uh, uh, review standards as well and consider them. And uh, either two separate documents will be, be, be prepared or we'll prepare one document that, that uh, opines and makes decisions on both applications. And we can talk about that as we get closer to that process. Um, again, staff, the peer reviewer, um, uh, and council are available uh, for you all to um, ask questions. Uh, a couple of other points I just wanted to make, which is, uh, you know, the planning board should act and must act as a body, not as individuals. Um, so uh, that means uh, it, in the context of this hearing and all hearings and in the context of the open meeting law, all your discussion and deliberation about this project needs to occur in public meetings here at published planning board meetings. While you may have questions for staff, individuals may have questions for staff, you need to be careful not to send out an email, you know, that includes every member of the planning board asking questions of staff. Uh, they should probably go, questions should probably go through the chair. So the chair is aware of, of what the issues are and then they should go uh, to Lauren or Eve uh, and then answers back can be provided at the next meeting so that everybody has all the same information or if there's a preparatory memo done uh, before the next meeting, then that memo can be done and provided to all of the board members at the same time prior to the meeting. But there shouldn't be back and forth amongst and between the board members uh, about particular issues that should be left for the public hearing. Um, let's see, uh, I think that's really, um, really it. Uh, that's sort of the key pieces. Um, uh, you will have, you know, you make sure to allow the public to comment um, and uh, you may limit their time. Um, uh, if the hearing is going long, um, you should think about in advance sort of a, a time frame you want to allow public comments to occur in. Uh, and then um, again, you figure out what, whether you want the applicant to respond then and there at that meeting, at another meeting, sometimes it may be a combination of both. Madam Chair, do you have any questions or do your board members have any questions? You're on mute. Um. Uh, what am I able to do with regard to communications with you? So, for example, um, if it comes to pass that there's a series of conversations that take place with the public at the public hearing and there needs to be um, responses that will be provided by the, the, for example, the engineers on the project, 
how mm -hmm. will that information, they will have it at that meeting, but how will it get conveyed back to us as ANSTERS? Will it only be in public presence or will they actually write documents? They, so uh, do you mean your peer review engineer or do you mean the project engineers on behalf of the applicant? Um, I would say by the uh, applicant's engineer because I think that the, the peer review seems to me to stand as a process by itself and then the, the yeah. project engineer is, is actually really in the driver's seat. So it, it depends on the question. Sometimes there will be a, uh, a written, um, uh, written responses prepared uh, back to uh, the planning staff um, and then that can be circulated to the board in advance of the meeting so they have an opportunity to review it before the meeting and then they can discuss it and ask questions about the responses at the meeting. All right, all right. Uh, Paul Grady. I... You're asking... Yeah, go You're ahead. Sure. You're asking us to act as a board, but just for clarification, but I'm not if I had a question for Clark and I notify the board of that question as a courtesy. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to send it to the chairman and I have a question for Clark or Eric or Paul Cleary. Uh, you're asking us to act, act, you know, act as a board. So I'm a little confused by your explanation to be quite honest with you. Yeah, so under the open meeting law requirements, uh, any communication between board members that, that goes into deliberation uh, and asking questions can be a form of deliberation, um, has to be reserved for the meeting. So you are not able to send emails that talk, and you shouldn't send emails that, that ask questions or discuss the project that is being considered in front of you. You should save those questions and comments for the meeting. So you may ask Clark that, co that question in the meeting. If it's, a, if it's a question that needs staff input, or council input or peer review input, um, then I think you would send it to the chair who would then send it to um, you know, the appropriate staff person, or you could send it to Lauren, I'm not sure how, whichever way is preferable, um, uh, but it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be having a question back and forth session with Clark. Uh, no, that about, I understand. That, that's what yeah. I was looking for in your clarification. I appreciate yeah. it because I thought it was sending even if it was offline, not in pertaining to the uh, subject at hand. So I appreciate yeah. the explanation. Um, I have a question, which is uh, you refer to or infer that we can speak with the peer review. Is that correct? Um, or is it that it has to go through a funnel like you're describing and we should be best to send it either through me or directly to Lauren uh, or Eve? Yes, I, I, so it should go through a funnel process um, so that then when the, you know, you may want to collect the questions for the peer reviewer uh, and then they go to the peer reviewer and then the peer reviewer's responses come back and go out in writing and then can be discussed at the, pub, the next public hearing. Uh, Tom? I just, I just want to be clear because today we received a memo from Eve, um, which I would normally have a number of comments about. So if I want to direct comments to Eve about it, send it to Amy. I'm not permitted to just CC the board so they know what I'm asking. Correct. Okay. You should not CC the board. All right, and so, in fact, those questions and comments may very well be best done in the meeting, not by email, in a public discussion. Uh, Lauren? Oh, well, 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 sorry, sorry, Tom. I, I would just say sometimes maybe you don't want to do that, but uh, to the extent you're going to question some of the conclusions that are being made of your own expert. But I understand the open meeting law thoroughly, and if that's what we do, that's what we do. All right, um, uh, Lauren. 
Thank you. I would just like to add that if there's members who would like to communicate with planning staff, um, you're welcome to send anything to myself and, and copy the chair on it as well. That's something that we can do or I can send it to the chair as well. And I would also just ask um, if the chair would allow, uh, before we get into the next hearing after we conclude this discussion, if I could provide a quick introduction just to really explain who our team is and what the roles are to sort of clarify this as we move forward. Uh, yes, that's that will be just fine. Uh, uh, and so it will be in that conversation, Lauren, where you will explain how we interact with Eve, which it sounds like we go through a funnel. In all instances, a funnel is created and it goes to you, or if it comes to me, it goes to you. That is what I understand. Let me say one other thing. Everybody knows that you can raise your hand um, if you're a member of the meeting. On your right hand side, you just click the participants and up will come a screen. It'll be, I monitor that pretty well. And uh, I think it would make it easier for you to know that I know you're there if you have your hand raised. Um, if, it, if there's no traffic and, and only one person wants to speak, then it's fine to signal in, you know, just like this. But if we have many people trying to speak, I'm gonna have to create an ordered system to be fair to everyone. So please start getting used to using a raise the hand. All right. Um, so Lauren, would you like to explain to us how this next stage in the process is going to unfold? Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. So just an introduction. Um, and before I even get into introducing our team, just for the general public purposes, we do have a question and answer function that we will be using. Um, Jen will be, uh, Jen Orm will be helping facilitate those questions at the end. So any questions that you would like to ask, we would ask that you state your name and address and ask your question and we will get to those um, as appropriate. With that said, I'd just like to introduce, as I mentioned, our team before we hear from the applicant. I'll speak a bit briefly about each team member, their role in the process, and then you'll hear a bit more from each of them later in the meeting, at which point they can further introduce themselves and their qualifications prior to their presentation of information. After we do um, this introduction quickly of our team, uh, I would just like to just revisit the proposed tentative schedule and take a vote from the members. While the schedule is subject to change as the hearing progresses, we, uh, it would be helpful to have something um, to plan on for all of our participant purposes, whether it's lining up, you know, if we have a traffic engineer that needs to be there a certain night and not another, um, we just wanna make sure that we have some sort of predictability to the schedule as we move into our next meetings. So um, if there's any members that have a conflict, we can discuss it at that time. So with that, um, I will introduce our team. I'll start with myself for those who don't know me. I'm the planning director I'm here for the town of Cohasset. I've been with the town for uh, just over a year now. Um, prior to that, I had municipal planning experience and nonprofit planning experience most recently in the town of Milton, Massachusetts. I do have a master's degree in uh, city, community, city, community, and regional planning from Boston University. I have um, other credentials areas in public policy and sustainability. And um, just to let you know that my role in this process is uh, to provide technical assistance to the board, uh, to be a central point of contact for all parties, whether that be the applicant, the consultants, the board members, I uh, will be a central repository of information. And I'm also the main contact for receiving written public from the comment, which I have been receiving, I have been distributing to the board, and I continue to receive comment. Any member of the public wishing to contact me, I can be reached via email at lind, that's L-L-I-N-D, at cohasetma.org. So please, um, if you have anything that you'd like to submit to the board in writing, you can send it to me via email and I will make sure it gets to them. Next, um, we have Jennifer Oram, my, um, my office mate, and as the assistant director of the Planning Permits and Inspections Department. Jen has been with the town of Cohasset for um, almost 15 years at this point. Um, with support of much of zoning experience, we would work closely together. She is a keystone at Town Hall. She assists in day-to-day -day support of both planning and zoning functions, among other permitting and interdepartmental duties. And she will be directing our Q&A session uh, post hearing and will be assisting with various meeting logistics. Next, I'll just um, highlight Eve Tapper, who is on the call with us. Eve, we have brought in as a um, temporary planning consultant. Eve has a wealth of municipal planning experience. Most recently, she has founded her own planning consulting firm. Eve, actually, um, many of you will recognize her. She worked as interim planning director here in Cohasset between the time of the departure of my predecessor and my arrival. 
Um, Eve brings an individual planning perspective and will advise the board on best practices and will be assisting the planning board in navigating this process, leading discussions and um, helping the board navigate different planning principles. Based on her expertise and familiarity with the cost of zoning bylaws, we felt that Eve would be a great fit for our team that adds necessary staff capacity during what is a very busy time for us. Um, you'll hear from Eve later in the evening and she can elaborate more on herself. Um, next in our team is, as you've, as you've heard from our uh, attorney, Karis North. Karis North is the uh, designated planning board special counsel. She is involved um, in all planning board business, providing legal guidance and works closely with us. Um, next, I'll touch on our peer review team. The firm that we have, uh, that we will be working with on this is Weston and Sampson. It is a well-respected firm in the industry with over 500 employees and numerous locations throughout New England and the East Coast. They offer interdisciplinary design, engineering, planning, and environmental services. Our primary contact for this project uh, will be Darian Kajurkian, who is with us on this call. He's the senior project manager and environmental engineer. We also will be working uh, primarily with James Rorden, who's an environmental planner and scientist. With that, uh, those are our two main points of contact at this point, but we will also be working with and hearing from additional members of their team with expertise and additional disciplines as we get further into the process and into the details of the different um, disciplines of this, of this project. Um, so before we move on, I also just wanted to address some inquiries raised by uh, some of the members of the board leading up to this meeting. Um, there was some questions on how we chose a peer reviewer for the project. This did go through, uh, there was a request for qualifications process issued by our procurement department. Uh, there was a, a formal process, there were several inquiries received, a series of interviews, and then the team chose to enter into contract negotiations with two firms, one, um, one sort of smaller based firm and um, a larger firm. Being that Weston and Sampson is the larger firm with um, you know, additional staff capacity and expertise that would be in-house, um, it was chosen that we would use Weston and Sampson for this project based on the scale of the project. Um, the next question that I'd like to address, um, Member Callahan raised whether, the, whether Weston and Sampson had been vetted for conflict. Um, the answer is yes, they were. This was conducted by the procurement team during the RFQ process. And in the interest of full transparency, I just want to inform you that Weston and Sampson did disclose a relationship with the applicant, uh, a different side of their firm and different members. This um, disclosure was uh, reviewed by our, by our special counsel and by our procurement team. And it was uh, determined that there was no conflict. So since the question was posed, I wanted to address it publicly for all of the members and the public to be on the same page. Uh, Attorney North can speak to the no conflict determination. And if there are any planning board members that have specific questions on how the RFQ process was conducted, I would be happy to set up a conference with our procurement director for you to, um, to ask those questions specifically. So um, with that, I will ask, I'll pause a moment before we get into schedule to see if anybody has any questions. Seeing yeah. none. Oh, can we ask a question? Or, or Lauren, um, if possible, is could we compile a um, a document of pictures of people who we will be working with, so that when the time comes and we switch from the condition we're in to a face-to-face -face condition, we will have a way to recognize people right off the bat. That I think that would be helpful. Um, it's not something that has to be done immediately, but I think sometimes putting a face to a name is, is helpful and, and uh, understanding. I would be happy to do that. Amy, that's called uh, creeping on Instagram or Facebook. Clark Brewer. It was a joke, it was a joke, guys. Yeah, uh, something that I think would help uh, everybody uh, to be organized with this is to get a list a running list of all the documents that we've received uh, related to the special permit. So the first, the initial filing would be um, listed each document and then um, um, the, 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 the staff report and the matrix and, and Eve Dapper and the, and the consultant, um, all of their input. Um, if we could have a date that we've received it and then um, a description and who it came from. I think it's gonna, you know, as, as well as, um, you know, members of the public that um, have uh, sometimes surprising and marvelous insight. Uh, I think that's gonna be important for all of us so that we know we all have it, we can see it, we can look at it. 
uh, when, whenever uh, we're doing research um, uh, outside of uh, hearing time. So just in anticipation of every meeting, having like, you know, the, the, the bibliography. Um, I think that's a great recommendation. Do we have a way, Lauren, to um, provide an open access library of materials so that the public who wishes to go in and look can do that? Yes, we certainly do. We have all of the application material that was submitted for the application currently on the website. We will continue to update that. And I also would be happy to continue to um, create a sort of central repository of information as Clark has suggested of all of the documents and those can be made publicly available as well. So just, with that, but I, I, just I was also, I thought he, Clark wanted to have a record from the beginning of the project. So does that what you just described include that? Yes. Okay. Is right. it, okay. Yeah. And if I may, Madam Chair, those documents will also be necessary when the time comes to actually craft a decision. So that will be work done in advance. That would be very helpful. So if there are no further um, questions on this, I would just like to request that the board take a vote on the schedule. I will share my screen so that you can see our current proposal. Bear with me one moment. Okay. This is our current proposed tentative schedule. Again, I would just like to be very clear that this is subject to change based on how our hearing process unfolds and how much follow up and questions that are needed. But at this time, are there any members that recognize a meeting? Um, this is something to remain cognizant. If there's meetings that you may not be able to attend, um, you know, in terms of voting requirements, it's important that we keep track that members cannot miss more than one meeting. This looks good. Put on my calendar. I'll Lauren. make a motion that we adopt the schedule. Second it. Sorry. Hi. Bye. Just a minute. I'm trying to bring up everybody again. So, uh, Eric, would you like to begin? Aye. Okay, Clark Fuhrer. Aye. Um, Tom Callahan. Aye. Paul Grady. Aye. Amy Glassmeyer. Aye. Thank you. And that's all I have for you. I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Uh, ask um, uh, Eve uh, one question, which is, if, would you like to introduce yourself for those that don't no use and she will be um, at different points in time our point of contact when Lauren is um, overwhelmed with <laughs> high, sure. a lot of wor work. Uh, sure I'm happy to be back. I've, I met many of you not all of you um, a year ago when I was um, working in Cohasset um, as, as Lauren uh, noted in interim in between uh, Peter Machek who left and before um, Lauren was hired I'm, I'm very pleased to have been part of the team that that uh, hired Lauren because she's just fabulous. So you guys are very lucky. Um, and I'm glad to be back. Just a little bit of a background. I have a master's in planning um, from the University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, I spent the first six years out of college working for a congressman in DC. So I have some, my background started with politics and then kind of moved into more uh, specifics um, with regard to planning. Uh, and, and I just wanted to say at the outset that my role is as an additional staff person to um, help the board come to a decision. It, it is not my intention to um, try to sway the board one way or the other. Um, I'll just point out some issues that uh, the last memo, the first memo that you've gotten are just some things that I noticed at the very beginning. I haven't been on the board for very long. Um, my goal is really to allow there to be a fair and, and um, process and whether the board decides to approve this project or not approve it is not my decision. And if you don't agree with some of the um, ideas that I've brought up and questions to ask, um, that's fine too. I just want to put it out there that I um, can be a resource from a technical perspective, um, but also that I'm working for the town and my goal really is to see 
um, that a decision gets made one way or the other, and that the um, if, if the project is approved, it's approved um, to the satisfaction and the goals of the town and, and as well as the property owner. Um, so that's kind of my role. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and, and let's just move on. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Lauren, would you mind putting the schedule back up? And um, let me begin by saying for those of you that are new to a planning board hearing, the next stage is to open a public hearing. And when we open a public hearing, we ask the clerk to read the statement that opens the public hearing. Um, and that's number one. Number two, I want people to recognize that we are now about 45 minutes beyond where we expected to be at this moment. And we are expecting today to have an introduction to the project, uh, a discussion of the site plan, layout and public realm and traffic and circulation. Um, I would like the um, uh, consultants and uh, the presenters to consider the fact that it is now 45 minutes late and, and I'm asking simply to, uh, for those who are here in the audience and also those that might have family responsibilities, because we sort of have a time that we run these meetings and we try not to go too far over that, which is about 9.30. Um, is do they feel comfortable being able to cover that material in the time that we have um, between now and um, 9.30? So um, uh, let me open up the public hearing and uh, I will ask uh, Paul Grady to read and open the public hearing. And then um, uh, the question that I asked about whether or not we will have enough time, um, uh, I would like to get an answer from the presenters. So Paul? I'd love to read it, but I don't have it in front of me. Could we post it so I can read it? I left all my paperwork. Uh, in Amy, we, we read the public hearing on the 17th of June. Public hearing notice has oh, been right. um, read. So then that means so we, that we just begin. That's right. Um, all right. Thank you for that, Clark. Uh, Eric? Oh. I, I always see on the schedule there's, there's about three hearings, right? The public hearings. Is that right, Lauren? Looks like there's after this one, right? We're already at 7 45, 8 o'clock. So, so there's the July 15th, August 5th, September 9th. Include public hearing September 23rd. I, I, I understand that it's a it, it's it's a big responsibility of the planning board to uh to just to, to to come to do these these meetings, but we do you know volunteer to, to and we we're elected positions I just think that my concern is is is, is before we, I mean after nine o'clock everything starts going south right so are we gonna be rambling on for hours and hours are there other things on those agendas for those dates and if they are I would I would propose that you know why don't we just allow that the that these meetings be be, be totally uh, allocated towards this this very important you know, special permit, rather than you know wasting uh, an hour and a half on you know administrative and other you know hearings. And if we need to throw another meeting in there, these Zoom meetings are very very easy to do. You can do it on your cell phone. Why why would we you know waste an hour and a half of time and then push everybody to nine or ten o'clock? Everyone's going to get grumpy. People aren't going to be paying attention, and and it's just a disservice to everyone. You know, why not just get out of the gates, open up a meeting? And on these dates, and, and go right at it, and that way we can crank it out and get the get this done for, and that's going to be in the best interest of the citizens and the developer, and and, and everybody. You know, I, I just feel like after I'm speaking for myself, after nine o'clock, after nine thirty, I'm starting to you know I'm starting to lose steam a little bit. So I can imagine that a lot of people are starting to feel that way as well. Um, with Zoom, the one thing, I, even though I hate Zoom, the one good thing about Zoom is you could be in, you know, you know, in Barcelona, you know, Spain, and so, you know, a, a call in. So uh, I just would really like to see that we get this thing moving along so that people don't get bogged down with nonsense and lose steam and, and, and we really start to, to unravel a little bit. But, but I'll defer to you, Lauren. 
Um, so I, I'll just make a comment. I think we raised this issue in earlier discussions as we were leading up to this public hearing. And I think Lauren worked very hard to lay out what she thought was reasonable. And we have to take into account the fact that we have to do the, the town's business in addition to conducting this public hearing. Um, that's all I would have to say. What do you, Lauren, would you like to comment? Sure. So the first um, initial proposal did have this stretching out further towards November. Um, the board had asked for it to be condensed. They did not want um, this to, you know, to have so many hearings over um, a certain period of time. So this was a, an attempt at condensing. With that in mind, I've tried to be very uh, transparent that this is subject to change um, because there are other items that will come up in our, I, I already know um, of a couple applications that we will need to address in the coming months. So with that, I would, um, you know, turn back to the board and, and seek your, how you would prefer to move forward on this. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I, I would think condensing is the way to go here, guys. I mean, this is a big project and to drag it out over months uh, seems like not the way to do it because people are gonna forget what they talked about last meeting. Condensing, this looks like a great schedule for this particular matter. I, I, I think it's awesome. I think that's great, you know, but uh, uh, I personally wouldn't mind, you know, if, if throwing in a, a July 22nd meeting or an August 14th meeting or something like that for other matters that don't re that relate to uh, the, the, this special permit so that we can keep this on schedule, not drag it out so that, you know, it goes on into November or e even further uh, and stay focused on the matter at hand. And, uh, it, but also not be bogged down with, with stuff that's gonna take an hour and a half or whatever it may take. And then we get to the meat of things and we're already at eight o'clock. I mean, it would be, in my opinion, my soul uh, vote would be to, let's throw it on a meeting in there if we have to for a large home review or whatever it may be, you know, to, to, to take care of that stuff so that we can focus on what is probably the most important a uh, special permit to come in front of the, the town of Glasset within the last, you know, who knows how many years, right? Um, uh, Lauren? Thank you. So I will suggest in the interest of time that uh, we, since the board already voted and felt comfortable with this schedule, that we would move forward here. And I will pull the board um, offline later this week on when we can fit in another meeting, perhaps in late July or some point in August to address other business if the board feels comfortable with that. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, that sounds to me like a good idea. And, um, and consolidating those. It's also possible to just basically stick to the, to the schedule. We've had a lot of business that we had to do and we won't be having to do that again. Um, all right, so with no further ado, Lauren, are you going to be doing the introductions? No, I will not. I will um, turn it over to the applicant to begin their presentation. And I will um, ask because there's a lot of people who need to be presenting. If you are not currently speaking or need to present, if you could um, mute yourself and, and turn your video off, that way we can help um, focus the conversation and with technical speed issues. George, do you have the ability to share your screen? Uh, we're gonna, Ted is uh, sitting six feet away from me here. Uh, if you can allow him to share the screen, he'll run through the, the slide deck while I talk. You should be able to pull right. up. Ted should be able to share his screen now. All set. I presume that uh, we're all set to start. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, obviously, congratulations, Madam Chair, and to Mr. Callahan on your new positions. Uh, good evening, board members and all participants and the public that are watching tonight. Uh, obviously, 
Very excited to be presenting on behalf of the Cohasset Hospitality Partners this project. It's been a long time coming. Uh, we have, uh, by way of introduction, my name is George McGoldrick, live at 107 Border Street. I have been a town resident for 28 years. My wife, Mary, and I raised our three children here. Uh, she and I have been very active on numerous boards and committees in the town over the last 28 years. Uh, also with me tonight, socially distanced on the other side of the room is Ted Lubitz. He is also a, he is a lifetime Cohasset resident and in fact is a neighbor of mine here over in Border Street. <clears throat> the application that we put forth in front of you, I will go through how we got here, the process that we went through, talk about how all the different constituents of the harbor have contributed to really what this project is. It's certainly and absolutely is not something that we sat in a room and conjured up ourselves. This was something that has been in the, in the works for quite some time. In fact, I'm sure that this project of tearing down the hotel has been on people's minds since the day it opened in the early 70s. There was a attempt about 20 years ago to do some work in the harbor, which did not go anywhere. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, we're now here to talk about the process that we have been through and talk about the project that we are presenting to you. The existing uses that we have on the prop today, Ted, you have one job to do. Obviously, the old Kimball's Hotel, which opened in the early 70s uh, via a special permit, <clears throat> is in the forefront there. And then across the street is 87 Elm Street. The hotel has got 55 rooms, has restaurant space and special event space. And across the street at 87 Elm, there's five apartments and some commercial space. The process that led us until tonight, again, I think started 50 years ago when the hotel opened, but more recently started almost exactly two years ago when an out of town developer named Harbinger put both the Cohasset Harbor Inn and Atlantic and Old Salt House under agreement with the previous owner. And then he approached the town and started discussions about renovating the properties, tearing them down and upgrading the harbor. The town then started the process of looking at a zoning change for the properties to include a residential use. And in fact, had put it on for the fall town meeting in 2018. In the late summer of 2018, Harbinger approached the town and told him that he withdrew from his agreement with the previous owner. The town in the near time frame also then decided to move the Warren article to the following year. It was in October of that year that Ted, myself, and Alex and Angel Marconi started talking to the previous owner who we understood was in serious financial trouble. Over the course of the next four months, we ended up reaching an agreement where we took over three properties, the two I just mentioned, as well as the Red Lion Inn in town, and took over full responsibility of running them and ownership of the properties as of January 2019. We had some initial discussions with the town about what the town wanted to do down at the harbor. And at the time, the town also then started and hired Harriman consultants who were working on the harbor plan to help the planning board draft the zoning article for the spring town meeting in 2019. April 2019, the town overwhelmingly voted over 350 people showed up at town meeting and voted in favor of putting an overlay just on the area where the 124 uh, or the lower area of the cove of the harbor is and elected not to rezone or change anything up at Atlantic Old Salt House or at the Mill Wharf buildings. We started then holding community forums to talk about what the town 
community abutters, neighbors wanted to see out there. In November, the planning board approved the harbor design plans and guidelines. The master plan was also approved that year. So during 2018 and 19, the master plan, the harbor plan and the zoning overlay basically laid out the parameters for what could be developed on the site that we're talking about tonight. So once we had all that information, can you go to the next slide, please? Once we had all that information, again, the master plan, what the zoning bylaw allows, what the plan, the harbor plan wanted, we looked and saw what the public benefits needed to be. We looked at feasibility of a project, public-private partnership of doing something together. We took all the public comments in. We had consultant input from not only our own consultants, but also the town consultants. And then over and above, we looked at balancing the uses of the land here in order to come up with a project that we hope the town agrees with us that it betters the harbor access for everyone, that it improves the visibility of the harbor from numerous locations. And it also helps the viability of an access to the waterfront. These quotes here that we're showing now are directly from the Harbor Plan and the Master Plan. And you'll see that we've checked the boxes. What we're proposing supports a variety of uses. We're trying to enhance the land and water in the edge and support access to the harbor trying to balance the needs of the neighborhood and the town. In the master plan in 2019, it talked about transforming this important part of the harbor front and the waterfront and opening up views from Elm Street, which turns into Margin Street. So it's always been called the Elm Street View Corridor, but it's Elm and Margin Street View Corridors to improve pedestrian connectivity and bicycle access and safety, which is a very important thing we'll get into later on. Create more recreational resources. And then finally, to prioritize protection of open spaces. So again, with all these, from the, all these things that we've done with the Harbor Plan and the Master Plan and the zoning, we then created a project that again, checks the boxes for the zoning in terms of creating a new captain's walk access along the waterfront. So that no longer people have to go around the building, which is a very unsafe situation as it stands today. And we'll be able to continue from Margin Street along the waterfront out to Border Street. We have the no build setback, which we've actually, under the zoning was required to be 25 feet and we have significantly larger. We've created the view corridor that was required. We're maintaining the height requirement under the zoning. We believe we've adhered to all the design guidelines. We contain a mix of uses. Our density is actually less than what a zoning is. Our lot coverage is less than what's required. We have a, a parking requirement we meet. The ground floor public use we meet and exceed significantly. There was one issue on a, a parking requirements for commercial that we don't meet. And that's one of the few things that we're asking for the town to look at. And we have a backup data as to why we think that it. And finally, we're conforming with the Harbor Plan, Master Plan, and most importantly, we have strict conformance with the chapter 91 requirements. And we'll get into that later on and the importance of that and actually the benefit that that does and gives to the town. Some of the comments we received during the, our public meetings were to maintain increased public parking at the Veterans Park, which we will be doing. Reduce the number of current access points from the property that now there are four. We're proposing to eliminate three of those four curb cuts, increase public access to the harbor. Right now, there is no public access to the harbor. And we are proposing to create a 20,000 square foot public park along the waterfront. Provide a viable mix of commercial and active ground floor uses, which we will do. We're adhering to the height limitation that's required under the zoning. We're providing recreational uses and spaces for bikes, kayaks, and paddle boards. In terms of water connectivity, the town pier, you'll see on the plan how the walkway connects uh, and easily connects to the current town pier. 
that's along Morgan Street. One of the comments was whether or not the property could be 100% open space. And obviously in order to create the public park, we need to have some development there. Uh, we have looked and spent a lot of time on the resiliency and flood preparedness. We are providing significant outdoor space for the public, as I mentioned, the 20,000 square foot public park, which you'll see in a minute. And we also have providing commercial uses with retail, where we have over 3,500 square feet of retail space available, which could hold five to seven different types of businesses down there, plus an additional seasonal kiosk, which we're proposing outside that can help maintain and some of the businesses in the village to have a, an off-site presence down at the harbor as well. Our development team, obviously is Chai Elm Street Realty is the LLC we set up for this and that consists of the four principals, myself, Ted Lubitz, Alex, and Andrew Marconi. We've hired CBT as our architect. CBT is an internationally known architectural firm based in Boston. Uh, I have used them in the past uh, numerous times, including over at the Black Rock Country Club and the homes and the residences of Black Rock. We have an award-winning design landscape firm, local civil engineering firm that everyone is familiar with in Cabanero. We have a legal team based in Hingham. And then we have a Boston-based Vanessa and Associates as our traffic engineers. Existing uses we're all familiar with, unfortunately. The, the building that's now up against the water, no public access, blocking views. The middle slide shows the current view down Elm Street and Margin Street. And there's a wall that now is created between the community and the, and the waterfront. And then the buildings across 87 Elm, which traditionally have been unoccupied in the last number of years and dilapidated apartments in the rear. Under the zoning that was approved, we had to take a look at what the plans would allow us to do and the zoning would allow us to do. Because we had committed to providing the view corridor along Elm and Margin Street. And we had committed to a larger than what's required under chapter 91 walkway and public space along the waterfront. The slide on the left was prepared by Harriman for the town for a public meeting back in March to show what could be done on the site under the current, under the zoning that was passed by the town. The slide on the right, which you'll see quite often over the next few months is our proposed site plan where we have tried to take all of the guidance that was provided by the Harbor plan, the master plan and the zoning overlay and tried to create a commercial and residential space that obviously we can be proud of as I'll be driving by this for the rest of my life, but also create a lot of public space and most importantly, public access to our great waterfront. On the top of the screen is a view, bird's eye view come taken from Border Street, looking over Veterans Park to the site. The parking that you see there is an existing parking lot that's currently owned by the town and by ourselves. There is a very irregular lot line that goes through that parking lot. Because of the necessity of having parking for the Legion and for the Veterans Memorial, we are not touching that parking. In fact, we're keeping the same number of spaces, adding a handicap space as well. The middle frame shows a view coming up Margin Street from the old Roy Estate. And you can see the beginning of the captain's walk. That first floor space you see there is actually commercial retail space for the public. And on the bottom of the screen, you'll see the new view that we're proposing along Elm and Margin Street, where you now have a view out to the water as you're coming down Elm Street from town, which connects our downtown to the harbor. One of the main issues that the Harbor Plan had called out for. There are three new view quarters that are being created. 
the Elm Street and Margin Street view corridor, a pedestrian view corridor through the property, and then Summer Street looking across over to the harbor. I'd actually add a better view corridor from Border Street, which we travel every day. On this plan, you'll see the Harbor Walk and also the green is the publicly accessible park that we'll be creating. The public benefits of our proposed project are to create a park where there was none, to create a Harbor Walk. We have a no build setback of a minimum of 25 feet. And again, in a number of areas exceed that by almost double. Within the chapter 91 area, and the chapter 91 area, of course, is the is a line that was predetermined and requires to have public access. We have 11,000 square foot park within chapter 91, and then an additional 8,800 square feet outside of what's required under chapter 91. Obviously the new view corridor, we're maintaining the parking. We're looking to add some parking along Margin Street, which would support the commercial retail use that's down on that end. And obviously we're talking about adding bike spaces, kayak racks, et cetera, to the proposed project where there is none now. Under the plan that we're presenting to you tonight, the proposed real estate tax revenue could be in excess of $400,000, which compares to the existing two properties having a total of $62,000. Obviously when we do building permits, there are building permit fees. And under this plan, we have uh, underground and or concealed parking on the project. On the view corridor, we just wanted to show what the annual town meeting was presented. That was presented by, I believe, the planning board. The Cohasset Harbor plan that was approved shows is the middle slide and then our proposed. So we believe that we adhere to exactly what town meeting voted on and to what the harbor plan had requested. The building program that we're proposing has three components. For now, we're calling them the north, south, and west buildings. The north building runs along Margin Street, contains 13 units, the six first floor units and seven townhouse units above it. There's about 2,400 square feet of retail space at the waterfront side, and the underground parking is beneath the building. The south building contains six units. That's along Elm Street. Three units on the first floor and three townhouse units on the second floor. And again, the underground parking goes beneath both the north and south buildings. Across the street on the west building, we have a total of 10 units. 1,200 square feet of commercial space and all the parking is screened from the street. So I'm now gonna turn it over to our legal counsel, Adam Brodsky, to talk about some of the issues. Zoning, Adam. Thank you, George. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My name is Adam Brodsky. I'm an environmental and land use lawyer with Drowen, Tachill, and Morgan. Uh, thank you, George. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with George and Ted and this design team. I have a re relatively easy job um, because uh, this project has been so well designed, and I'll be brief. Uh, the property at 124 Elm Street, where the Cohasset Inn is located within the Waterfront Business and Harbor Village Business Overlay District, the HBVOD District, and I hope I say that correctly each time. The property across the street at 87 Elm Street is located within the Downtown Business Zoning District and the HBVOD. Both properties are located within the FEMA flood zone and therefore within the town's floodplain and watershed protection district. We're proposing raising the existing buildings and constructing a new mixed use development. 
As George noted, there'll be underground and surface parking at 124 Elm Street and surface parking at 87 Elm Street. Uh, we require an HVBOD special permit in site plan review from the planning board. And because the project is located within the town's floodplain protection district, we also require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. That application has been filed and we will be meeting with the Zoning Board shortly. Once we're further along in the process and the design finalized, uh, we will be filing a notice of intent and a request for a stormwater permit from the Conservation Commission. And importantly, uh, the project has been designed uh, such that the proposed buildings are actually located outside of Chapter 91 jurisdiction. But as George noted, we will require a Chapter 91 license under the uh, State Water uh, uh, Waterfront Act from DEP for those elements within Chapter 91 jurisdiction, including the captain's walk. And again, my job is so easy because the project has been designed to meet or exceed all the requirements except for several minor, minor parking waivers which we're seeking. The project meets site plan approval standards under section 312.6. The project is designed in conformance with the HBBOD design guidelines. The project conforms with the key design and performance standards uh, for an HBO, uh, BO, H, uh, hang on, uh, excuse me, the, uh, HVBOD uh, special permit under section 322.6 and 22.8. And I won't go through those. George has noted those uh, in his slide. The only addition that I would add is that um, we're required under the bylaw to provide a minimum of 15% publicly accessible ground floor commercial use. And in fact, we're providing approximately 34% uh, of that particular use. Uh, we do require uh, several waivers from parking standards. Uh, the first concerns uh, uh, the number of parking spaces. Uh, we in fact propose more total parking spaces than are required. We're required under zoning to have 79 total parking spaces for providing 81, but we wish to provide more than the minimum required parking for multifamily residential use. So we're proposing two parking spaces per dwelling unit rather than the 1.5 that's called for in the bylaw for a total 58 parking spaces for that use. That exceeds the 44 parking spaces required by zoning. And we're doing this uh, for among other reasons, marketability. Um, these are uh, uh, luxury for sale units. And we thought it uh, appropriate to have two dedicated parking spaces for each dwelling unit. Uh, we're proposing 23 parking spaces for our retail use, which is based upon a parking demand study by Vanass and Associates. Uh, Vanass has calculated uh, that we would need 13 parking spaces at peak demand for our retail use. We're in fact providing 23. Uh, the zoning re requirement is 35, but again, uh, uh, we believe that 23 is more than appropriate for which we're seeking a waiver. And we're also seeking waivers regarding the size and configuration of certain of the parking spaces and drive aisles. And I'm happy to talk about that at a later time. And lastly, the project will comply with the town's inclusionary zoning requirements for affordable housing. Um, that will be a subject for discussion uh, another night. Uh, but again, I do want to note um, that this is not a rental project. Um, this is a luxury for sale project and we respectfully suggest that it may not be the best use of resources to be talking about affordable units on these properties um, and we wish to explore alternatives uh, for the benefit of the town. And again, I promise to be brief and uh, hopefully uh, that was brief and at this point I'd like to turn it over to CBT to give you uh, a sense of the architect. Thank you very much and please move on. Great. Hi, this is Haril Pandya from CBT. Uh, am I able to screen share? Let's see here. Oh, there we go. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Yes. 
Great, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, everyone else on the board. Uh, my name is Harvill Pandya. I'm a principal at CBT uh, in Boston and have been there for about 16 years uh, doing a fair amount of uh, residential work um, as well as uh, some master plan work. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'm really excited to see you uh, uh, at the at this uh, point, Chair, because I think this is a, a wonderful topic uh, for a really great town. Um, just to dive into it, I think, you know, these are a lot of the things that we really um, wanted to consider. And I think this is not just a, a localized, you know, project in, in many ways. I think the value here uh, is also the fact that we have a connection to the village. And I think there's been a lot of the Harbor Plan that not only talks about the value and the importance of it, but the real need to make sure that uh, the village and, uh, and the harbor are connected, and right now we're not only connect, you know, have a barrier from a physical perspective, but from a visual perspective. And I think George did a lot of the heavy lifting for me, and 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 did a, a great job explaining a lot of the benefit of what uh, the project uh, hopes to achieve. But I think just on a macro level, you know, to kind of talk about the viability and the importance of connecting these things together and using these as as, as bookends, if you will to really improve um, the connectivity uh, urbanistically. I know we're in a suburban context, but from a master plan or uh, a concept, you know, the, the idea here is to really try to create a fair amount of uh, connectivity. So, you know, we look at it from a myriad of ways. We look at a lot of the external forces and the internal, internal forces on the site that really impact how we uh, go about and approach this, not only from a resiliency perspective, which is really critical and important uh, along the, the harbor's edge, but also understanding, uh, you know, the flooding and and what what those issues are around uh, a town that's you know has all this wonderful waterfront and the water sheet that's a part of it. So there are a lot of components that we wanted to address. Obviously, it's hard to solve every uh, issue uh, we're confronted with, but I think we try to address them as best as we possibly can um, at, in a, in a, in a variety of ways and part of it is like George delineated is to really create that enhancement of the captain's walk the harbor's walk because it really allows connection to the pavilion the parks the town dock uh, restaurants etc to really kind of tie together um, really sort of a missing component if you will uh, along the harbor's edge which I think this project um, really starts to address so here's some views um, you know just kind of looking at existing views that are here today uh, down margin street or down elm street and down borders. So these are all the different, you know, wonderful access points, and you can kind of zoom out a little bit at the Harbor View. Everyone's sort of familiar with with the building um, that's there. So I think these are really important things to talk about because it's really a short walk from the village to the harbor. And I think having something to go to versus something to arrive to and just simply move around, I think, is is really a a, a component that we wanted to address. So here's a sort of an aerial, if you will, of the site plan we were just looking at. And again, looking at the different components that are not only there from an existing perspective, like the inn and how we're facing some physical barrier and visual barrier, but again, just to reiterate the ability to complete this edge along the water as part of our exercise and really try to improve that. And then, you know, to reestablish, if you will, connection with the captain's walk uh, around, around the site. And these are the two sites here, both at 124 and at 87. And of course, one of the things that everyone uh, is, is aware of and conscious of is really trying to open up that view corridor as, as best as we can, recognizing some of the, the, you know, the internal forces of the Harbor Walk being interrupted here, um, and then sort of the views again for the Cohasset and the public access. I think we really have an opportunity here, probably more than ever, to really make something wonderful appear um, at that part of the site. So just from a, a master plan perspective, you know, these icons really more represent um, you know, a couple of the components about activating the pedestrian piece, really improving connectivity, like I said, all the way to the village and its uh, immediate and adjacent uh, sidewalks and streets. A vibrant use of uses, and that's not only just residential, but some mixed use, some retail, uh, some external kiosks, et cetera, to kind of really uh, give people and the public and the community a reason to go there. Um, extending that harbor walk, something we talked about, the vibrancy of the harbor, and then uh, the public access to the harbor. So these are all really important pieces that we wanted to make sure that we are incorporating into everything we're doing. Um, and then uh, obviously the views and the beauty that exists there today is something that we really want to try to enhance. So at least even the folks that are going to be ultimately living here on this uh, uh, on this site are really going to benefit from looking out 
uh, to the water as much as they're able to look at the, uh, the, the parks and the, and the public improvements. So you can see here some of the icon. Um, sure, Janet is asking a question. I don't know if uh, should pause. I, th I think we're holding to the end, the questions. Uh, unless there's something that's a point of information to make it clearer, um, it would be better if we held off uh, questions until the end, if that's all right. Okay. I'm happy to keep continuing. Um, so here you can see some of the icons that we were discussing uh, previously here and sort of putting them on the site plan. So we can talk about the vibrancy of the mixed uses. We were talking about the more vibrant harbor edge. We were talking about the access to the harbor. All these things are sort of, um, you know, being superimposed, um, you know, on our, on our current site plan. And of course, not to mention, obviously, not only is the harbor important and, and critical, but I think we have some wonderful reviews, even from 87M, that uh, get to look at the James Brook and some of those views of nature, which I think are really quite nice as well. So we have some opportunities on both sites that are, are really quite wonderful. You know, just for point of mention, I think a lot of folks have seen this, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting nuance and peculiarity um, you know, with the site, not only to mention the irregular shape, but as George alluded to before, of the, of the lot line, but then you're really sort of trying to layer the multiple setbacks, um, you know, the jurisdictions and the different water dependent uses. And, you know, you're kind of really left with a really, for lack of a better word, a funky shape, um, a property to really kind of make sure we try to capitalize and use and, and try to really enhance. So I think that's really, um, you know, been one of the challenges, but something that we kind of really wanted to incorporate early. So you can kind of see here on this particular slide how the current building really kind of interferes and intersects with not only the views and whatnot, but some of the setback requirements that we're up against. So, you know, the goal here is to really improve the way uh, the physical form and the land uh, and the land form kind of intersects. So we kind of start removing uh, these, uh, these clashes, if you will. And the new proposed project here, you can see here, really tries to steer away from all the setbacks and meet all the setback requirements, the zoning requirements, and the one intersection of building and that space really is the facilities of public accommodation. So we are allowed to put some retail here that's not residential dependent that uh, is available for public use. So that is the one component that does intersect there, but we do, that does comply with the, uh, with the guidelines. Um, the image here at the bottom really is talking about, uh, you know, the height in the zoning envelopes that we were discussing. You know, one thing here to note more than anything is it's just sort of the eternal continuity of roof line on the existing in the kind of keeps, keeps going. Uh, and the one you know, opportunity we have here is that in the proposed is we have peaks and valleys and some open space and whatnot. So there's a more dynamic quality of the, of the building skyline, if you will. Uh, rather than just a continuous block. So that's, I think, a, a positive piece um, to, to keep in mind is that there are, you know, little peekaboo moments where we're able to be on the sidewalk and road and look up and look through the building um, rather than just a solid block. And then here's some of the landscape design parameters, and I invite Mark uh, you know, as well to come in and, and, and sort of dialogue with me on some of these pieces and to sort of really, um, you know, will kind of co-deliver some of these uh, important pieces. But you can see here, we are challenged with a lot of the, uh, the topography uh, of the site. You know, there's a lot of low points over here. There's some high points and we're trying to use the flood elevation as a, as a marking point. And that flood elevation uh, baseline that we're using is at nine. So everything really moves from, from, the, from that nine level. So the zoning compliance, the 35 feet, um, all of that is within compliance based on that, um, that component. Mark, is there anything you want to add to this slide before I move to the next? Yeah, I think one of the important things about this slide is it also shows the 10-foot harbor walk zone um, and the 25-foot no-build setback and how much further the proposed massing is from those requirements. This right. drawing also shows the Chapter 91 boundary, and you'll see those through the analysis as we go forward. Great. So this uh, plan starts to simplify some of those grading issues a little bit more. Um, if we think about the top of the harbor walk being at plus zero or elevation zero, you can see how there's a slight rise going up to margin street along the harbor walk and that the terraces are at plus four, plus five. So we're, we're raising up the ground level of the buildings to be at a resilient height um, to prevent flooding of those units. 
Um, but then even looking along uh, Summer Street and Elm Street, for instance, the, the sidewalk in some places is back at, at plus one. So it, it has some challenging uh, grading issues that we've been able to resolve um, through site design and architecture design. Great. So again, this is sort of reiterating what George was just talking about with the view corridors. The primary um, view corridors are from Elm Street, extended through Margin, uh, down Summer Street. And then there are also ones that are more at the pedestrian scale through the center of the project. Um, this becomes a main circulation spine between the units. Uh, and also the, the idea of being able to see through uh, the existing parking is really an important viewport into and even a physical connection that people can travel um, to connect uh, the street with the harbor. Yeah, and I think that's, some, that's, a, that's a really good point to remember. It's not only just simply providing the Helm Street um, and Margin Street view corridor component, which is there. I think, you know, again, it, it's about delineating the mass. It's about sort of breaking up some of the components to, again, create more views and vistas uh, that are available in a more, you know, in a wider aperture uh, than there is available today. So this next image gets to how the uh, proposed development approaches the street. So the zones that are indicated as orange here are street front access. Um, and this is a way of having the buildings in front uh, the street rather directly with little pockets of landscape that are these respite moments um, that happen in, in various different ways around the project. Um, and one of the ideas here is that this is the complete opposite of what the existing condition is. And that is that there's a surface parking lot and a building that's set way, way back on the site, creating not such a great sort of uh, urban condition, if you will, or a street front condition. Here, the idea is that the buildings move up and participate in the street and are, are sort of windows and doors on the sidewalk. Yeah, and I think that sort of is also part of engaging, you know, the residents to you know, create some activity along the edge because this is going to be a pretty active you know seasonal uh, use and I think it's important to remember that you know we want to encourage that sort of vibrancy around the entire uh, part of the site so I think you know the way the buildings engage um, with the sidewalk is, is, is important. So this is the idea of the Harbor Walk. So one of the great opportunities that this project has is removing a really large <laughs> impediment to, to realization of this idea that the Harbor Walk can connect the town dock with Lawrence Wharf and even beyond Lawrence Wharf. Um, so that's the first goal of the sort of public space within the project. And it connects to existing um, pathways and circulation um, from Border Street and the Veterans Park and continues across along the back of the seawall um, to connect over to Margin Street and the town dock. And then this, the second piece of this, if you want to lay on to the next one, is a secondary series of larger spaces. Um, these spaces are different in character. A lot of them are vegetated spaces. Um, we also have some that are paved spaces. So what we call the harbor terraces are related to uh, the retail function um, and allow different prospect, different seating kind of configurations. Uh, and so forth. It also uh, has a certain amount of flexibility within these spaces, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that the Harbor Plan, you know, does spend a fair amount of time talking about um, edges um, and how the edges are important. I think there's hard edges and there's soft edges and, you know, making sure that the resilient edge of the walk itself is also important. I think, you know, edges is such a great word because we have so many uh, ways that edges are defined and opportunities that each edge actually creates. So the, the permeability of certain edges, the solidity of certain edges, the water sheet creates that edge as well. And I think each one of these represents an opportunity um, you know, to this project in a way that's very, really, really unique. And I think you, uh, many people in the community will be able to participate uh, in, this, in this site uh, because of it. So I think that's important. So the level of either privacy to public, whether it's permeable or solid, uh, whether it's green or it's or it's hardscape, I think all these options are are being introduced um, into the into the project. So this gets at that same idea of how the buildings in front the street. So one of the really important ideas of making community is that the units actually have doors on the public way. So this diagram is showing how the units have their front doors on the street and the sidewalk. Um, and create a neighborhood as a result of that. This is really an important um, sort of community design idea uh, that this project supports. 
Agreed. Agreed. So the next slide shows that there's also uh, an interior circulation that allows every, everyone who lives in these units um, to the indoor amenity areas within the, both the 87 and the 124 Elm components, um, as well as the, the sort of common space, the exterior common space um, that's shared among the units. I think it's important to, again, create sort of this wonderful uh, mixing bowl, if you will, of creating these shared amenities that we, you know, we can, they all can use. And whether you live here or you're just passing through, you'll be able to see that activity and dynamism of the uh, of the site being used in different ways at different times of the day and different times of the year. So the next layer starts to talk about how the public actually engages in this. So um, as part of this plan, there's some retail um, square footage and function. This happens at different scales. Um, uh, the the part of the retail at 87 Elm, for instance, is different than the retail that's proposed and adjacent to the Harbor Walk. And there's also small kiosks that are sort of sprinkled through the Harbor Walk as well as a way of animating that space. And also, uh, as George mentioned, the possibility of retail establishments that are downtown to have sort of outposts here. Uh, another uh, way that we've seen these used in other projects is that these become sort of incubator spaces where business gets started perhaps in the summer and then ultimately expands to be a full-fledged restaurant downtown or something like that um, is another way in which a lot of municipalities use spaces like this. Uh, and then also connected to this are the ideas of these sort of layered terraces that have um, a, a slight grade change between them. So the dining terrace is slightly higher than the landing terrace. Um, and those allow sort of different activities uh, to take place there, different seating options to take place there. It allows more people to have a view because it's stacked something like an amphitheater in a way. Um, and that uh, the, all of those then are connected by the Harbor Walk. Yeah, and it's important to note, I think just as a, as a design firm, you know, we get asked quite often, especially now, about how some of these things are, you know, positive towards, you know, COVID and what we're learning from where we are today in these past few months. And to be able to have not only open air options that are, are gracious like this, I think it's also important to note that there's flexibility, as, as Mark was saying, that really kind of can delineate how seating goes. So you can, right now, you know, who knows how long it may last, but ultimately at least provide the flexibility for, you know, different seating options. So there's, you know, at least an emotional or psychological sense of comfort and distance as a part of this as we kind of get back to whatever the, uh, the new normal ultimately is. But I think we're seeing this a lot in our practice. We're getting asked a lot of this by, by towns, municipalities, clients, owners, et cetera. And I think it's an important thing to consider that this breath and this air and this opportunity really exists uh, as part of this sort of future forward, if you will. So one of the things that George mentioned in his opening comments were the <clears throat> addition of some parking spaces along Margin Street. Um, so what we propose here is actually uh, an accessible space that's very close to the retail that's proposed in the project, uh, a service space possibly, uh, and an additional parking space. Um, so that the first two are sort of more, and even the third one are sort of more transient in terms of their use. Um, but they just provide a closer access um, for the serviceability of, of the retail. This other blue dash line indicates where the accessible parking space is within the existing parking lot. Um, and you can see that the retail is actually served by both of those. And the Harbor Walk is also served um, by the latter one in the, uh, in the parking lot as well. Yep. Also noted on this are the, the bicycle spaces uh, along Margin Street. So then, you know, sort of picking up on what Harrell was just saying about social distancing and the, the ability to use space in different ways. This is really capitalizing on the existing Veterans Park and then proposing really just open lawn spaces that allow people to picnic, that allow there to be the possibility of doing a farmer's market or arts and crafts festival or music events, that sort of thing within the sort of very slightly sloped lawn space um, that just allows a lot, of, a lot of different uses within an area that's just lawn. And then what we're calling the sort of margin street event space or park space uh, within the view corridor um, is just another green space of a different scale. So you could imagine that you could have a really fairly large event that would actually occupy all four of these spaces, one of them being paved and three of them being landscape spaces that would really start to have a kind of waterfront um, festival that could even continue around the Lawrence Wharf as well. 
Um, so I think that presents a pretty exciting opportunity um, for Cohasset. Yeah, I think the opportunity that we, we forget sometimes uh, is the view back towards the project from the water. And as people are looking at it that way, to have an edge that could be animated through, uh, you know, a variety of uses, or you can see people or lights, et cetera, for some event in the future. I think that's it's an important way to look at the project. I think it's it's good to look at it, not only, you know, the, the, um, the connection of, the village, which, you know, we want to maintain that aperture so you can see, you'll see in a minute, we have some views, but, you know, not only see the aperture, but see people. And I think that's going to be important going forward. You know, this retail edge to be able to see people, this park, if there's an event and, you know, these, again, these are transient spaces. So, I mean, the goal here is to really be able to try to see through um, that, that, that area, but not only that, but hopefully see activity, which I think is also another way to, to, uh, to draw someone or draw people towards that area. So one of the other things that this uh, drawing proposed, we could go back for just a second. Oh, sorry. Yep. The, the red dashed line is the, an idea we had about like kayak and subboard rentals um, and their ability to launch those from the town dock. Um, this gives a place for storage and rental of that. Um, that's something that happens in my seaside town up on the North Shore. Um, that's been a really great part of the community um, to have uh, even people who don't own these could go and rent uh, a kayak and actually enjoy the water sheet of the harbor um, just as much as people who have their boat boats moored in the harbor. Um, yeah. So this sort of allows a different kind of access and activation of the water sheet. I, yeah, and I think it's, it's wonderful. I was just in Bristol, Rhode Island over the weekend and they had something very similar along the water and it was uh, really quite nice. All the, all the kayaks, everything were stacked. You can tell it was really um, in use. So really this is our last slide. Um, this speaks to the uh, circulation, um, the vehicular circulation. So the red lines indicate like where the curb cuts are um, and how the, the public lot is still accessed in the same way it is today. There's also uh, a branch that comes off of that into the underground garage um, on the 124 side. And similarly on the 87 side, um, there's a ramp that goes underneath the building and then parking is located um, underneath the building that also comes out um, to the brook. And the orange lines are indicating pedestrian circulation, the dashed lines are showing the private routes within the um, condominium complex, and the solid lines are the public routes um, throughout. So thanks, Mark, that's really helpful. Um, just to kind of pick it up uh, to keep a, an eye on time, I think, um, I think the idea here now is just to kind of give a quick sense of some before and after so we can just look at some imagery. I think a lot of the explaining that Mark and I were doing were really to sort of kind of get into the, the why, the wherewithal, the sort of how we got there. And then, you know, architecturally, as we review it and talk about it going forward, of course, a lot of these are still in concept uh, mode as far as the look and feel, but we wanted to create something that's fitting um, for that sort of shingle style look that is within the town of Capacity and it feels like it really belongs. So here's the before, if you will, of uh, the existing building, uh, the inn that's there today, and then the after. You just, you can tell there's a lot more wide open uh, spaces and again the, the north building, the south building. Here you only get to see one edge of 87. We're going to see some other views in a minute that we'll get to, uh, get to that. But again, just to, we're kind of going off an aerial that exists uh, today. So just try to match it up as best we could. Um, uh, with some software. Here's the uh, here's that view coming down uh, Elm and looking down margin. Uh, you can tell obviously a, a pretty good barrier that you know everyone's acknowledging cognizant of and then the ability to open it up and, and, and get a chance of uh, seeing this again. This this is that retail piece that hopefully we'll see some light in life and it also sets back so it's not a straight vertical street wall here at all. This actually keeps stepping back by eight or 10 feet. So the goal to be able to see beyond, this is the kiosk that Mark was referring to earlier, whether you see ships or activity, you know, to get some light, if you will, at the end of the tunnel, when you're driving down Elm Street, to be able to see this, I think is gonna be quite nice. Um, along with some uh, activity, we have to think of this uh, project in both daytime and nighttime, of course, and to be able to see lights and activities, a much different um, you know, look and feel. Again, here's the before, kind of looking at it from um, the memorial. And then the after, uh, sort of just looking at, again, the ability to traverse and walk along the harbor's edge, um, seeing some, some, uh, some kiosks, you see the parking, the ability to use this uh, softscape, the hardscape, et cetera, looking at a little bit more of the shingle style with a myriad of uh, different 
slopes and peaks to kind of really feel like you know it's a it's a project that has some breakdown and scale uh, and also breakdown of materiality I'm sorry materiality that we'll see some stone at the bottom as well as we'll see uh, shingle and uh, and whatnot again looking uh, through uh, the the project just this is when you kind of come up to the approach and you can kind of see down uh, Elm Street looking east here's an aerial looking um, sort of overview if you will across you can see the memorial in the lower right this is a sort of across the memorial, if you will. So again, looking at the Harbor Walk, and then you're able to see again, sort of the peaks and valleys, uh, be able to see through a lot of the you know, parts of the building. And this is sort of looking from the other side. So this would be uh, along the Harbor's edge, looking back towards uh, the project. Again, a break, the breakdown in scale, the shingle style, parts of the building even cut away to be able to see through the building. We want to have those different opportunities within the project. Again, just a little bit more of the nod to the architecture, you know, really sort of classic moves um, that are, are, are found quite uh, in many places in New England, um, as well as classic. This is sort of the Elm Street component uh, looking south. This is the, the West Building, uh, the 87 building. And here's the aerial. And then you can kind of see the whole project here now with uh, 87. Uh, the, the sort of the park, the Harbor Edge uh, here with the Memorial Park, the town dock, etc. The park um, down here. And then again, another view looking at the uh, across the Memorial. So that's our last slide um, from the presentation. Happy to uh, hand this over to traffic. Good evening, everyone. Oh, oh I'm sorry. No, no, just that I just want to say, please continue. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Andrew Arsenault from FNAS and Associates. Bear with me as I, can I share my screen, please? Thank you. Um, so I just want to briefly go through the, the transportation impact assessment report that we put together. Um, I'll try to keep it brief, just in the interest of time. Um, just to go down to the basic parameters of our study, you know, the key findings of our analysis was that under current ex existing conditions, there's acceptable operations for motorists, for pedestrians. In the future, we will continue with that. We will keep having acceptable operations. Um, we did not notice any specific road safety issues within a review of the mass DOT accident reports, any of our sites, any of our, um, our site review. Um, and we can accommodate the parking based on some of the national industrial standards of um, national industry standards that we've recorded over the past for similar projects um, in the past few years. Uh, lastly, there are lines of sight available to safely accommodate our project that we can either achieve or make achieve um, with a little bit of site work. I just wanted to go over our study area roadway networks. We have sidewalks, the orange dashed line along one side or both sides of every of the study area roadway networks. Um, we have relatively wide streets. Um, I think 14 feet is our minimum width, um, which is very generous. As far as trip generation, the project itself will look to generate about 300 trips a day and about 15 to 30 over the peak hour. So one at one car every two to four minutes. This is the parking demand calculations that we looked at and we looked at some of the national standards for similar uses for multifamily residential units and for retail space. And we came up with for 87 Elm Street between 15 and 20 parking spaces that we would demand throughout the, throughout the course of the day. And for 125, 124, we'd be around 30 to 40 
spaces. Again, that was just a brief, brief rundown of our technical report. I understand that the peer reviewer will take into it a little bit, a little bit deeper and, and present their findings to the board. But I just wanted to share some of our basic recommendations for you. I won't go into them in depth, but they're really just some common site safety and efficiency items. For example, we should have sidewalks linking our site to the existing roadway network as was shown with the, the Harbor Walk. Um, some of the more specific things would be to alter the existing angle parking along the west side of Elm Street and to consider adding some bump outs to help out pedestrians by shortening up that distance in the in the roadway. Um, it would also help kind of extend some of our site distances for people leaving Veterans Park, which can be kind of tight coming out of there currently. Um, and then our last recommendation is to develop and include a TDM package to eliminate trips before they even begin. Um, that would be by encouraging people to look towards taking a bike, non-motorized traffic um, to access the site, to access their destinations. Um, the Harbor Walk will of course help with that and the bike racks as well. Um, as far as that goes, I am, that is all I really need to present today. Um, I'd like to pass it over to George. Thank you, Andrew. So Madam Chair, that's our presentation tonight, which talked about the site work and the public realm, as well as traffic. Um, there are a few questions below. I don't know how you want to handle it or questions from the board, obviously but we're here to answer. Um, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure. Lauren, do you want to handle the questions? You want me to handle the questions and just read them out? Madam Chair, I, I was going to do that for you. This is Okay, Jen. that's right, that's right. Go so right I on. just, um, thank you. I just, um, a great majority, we've got a lot, we've got a few questions from the same people and I just want to reiterate, we do not uh, from everybody have addresses. I've asked them for addresses. Um, some people I know, but there is someone who just has one first name. Um, but would you like me to just read them anyway so they can be addressed and then going forward, if we could have names and addresses for the record, for the minutes would be great. Um, would you like me to start with uh, Katie Dugan from 100 Black Rock Road? Um, first, she wanted to thank Clark for being a great member of the master plan that was earlier. And um, and hope it continues to heavy lift on the master plan implementation committee. So that was one comment. Her second question is, um, she would like the Cohasset Harbor and team to address underground parking concepts. Is this practical given zone and flooding of margin Elm Street in recent storms? That's her first question. So yes, we have, we have looked at the flooding issue. We've been dealing with a couple of contractors from Boston who have done a number of projects, for example, within the seaport, that for the majority of buildings in the seaport have numerous levels of underground parking. And this is just one level of underground parking. So can I, can I just ask your answer um, indicates then that more levels equals higher complexity and this is one level and less complex. Uh, so, um, Ted, is that you? Who is that? <laughs> It was Ted Lewis on Echo. I don't okay. know. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a planet coming in. <laughs> there we go. Nope, oh, nope, you're, you're silenced. There we go. Okay. Uh, hi, we're having some technical issues with feedback. Sorry about that. Um, so it's, it's, I think George's point was that there are a lot of complicated um, garage systems that can be designed and built um, similar to ones in the seaport and other coastal communities. What we're proposing is one below grade structure 
um, it would be entirely flood proof. And we have a structural engineer, Vetus and Vetus, who actually has designed that um, flood proof garage. Um, the entire thing essentially has to be waterproofed and um, it's a very common system to do. The challenge is it's very expensive to build. Um, so it com comes with a premium. Uh, none of the mechanicals will be in the basement as well. Uh, and we also, um, if you notice, there is a ramp that actually is the only opening into the garage that can allow water into it. Uh, we would design and build a deployable, uh, essentially, gate. Um, and so that would prevent water to get in there in the very unusual circumstance that we did have rising tides. Um, the underground parking is actually what provides for us to be able to provide the park there. Um, with that, you know, parking has been expressed as a major concern and we're working with really tight sort of confines. So um, the logical place is to put it down there. And again, it, it just comes with a significant cost premium, but it is very achievable and, and quite common practice. Yeah, and this is Harel Pandia from uh, CBT, just, uh, just to add to what uh, Ted said. And uh, the, other, the other thing that we delineated was the fact that we have uh, a height change to kind of account for some of the you know typical flooding, if you will. That's the reason why some of this is plinthed up. The, the lawns are sloped, the terraces are raised, and, um, and we're up um, at a certain uh, flood elevation. So I think that's, those are all the things we are taking into consideration. So. Would you like me to read further questions? Please, just go. All right. Please. So um, we have a, a series of questions from uh, Christopher McFarland and more from Katie Dugan. So Christopher McFarland lives at 50 uh, Reservoir Road. Um, his first question, uh, he's a registered landscape architect and a resident, and you mentioned the view corridor down Elm Street, but the proposed building, parking, and raised deck all interfere with the view. Why not pull building back and create a real view? So the view corridor down Elm Street that was required under the zoning overlay and talked about at town meeting and in the harbor plan uh, actually had visuals that we showed earlier, but try to pull them back up now. If Ted can George, share his screen. I was gonna say, George, I can pull it up as well. Or, so again, the town meeting shows the area where the view corridor would be. The harbor plan shows it and then we've adopted exactly what the harbor plan and town meeting the slides from the very bottom are from the, the harbor plan as well okay yeah and i think just to add to what george is saying i think the you know i think i i hear chris's point you know in one way but at the same time i think you know, there, this is a, such a significant relief already from what was there. You know, I think there's a balance, and that's what George had alluded to before about the economics of creating this, as well as making sure that we are getting some sort of continuity to be able to see that. So I think another question earlier I even addressed, you know, the, the importance of the village and to be, to be able to see that, uh, that view court all the way through. I think this goes a long way to do that. And the decks are flush actually with the retail. They're not raised any higher. So they are, they would be flush uh, to grade there. So we're not, there's nothing really blocking it, if you will, um, as a physical structure. So just to add to that, sorry, George. In addition, as Harrell mentioned earlier, the lower level on the end of the building is set, is out and the upper levels are set back. So there is more view. And in addition, if you look at the bottom of the screen, the two squares that were required under the harbor plan, we've actually gone and given significantly more view. If you look at on the proposed to the left of our arrow is all open space and view corridor as well. That actually we could have built on that area uh, under the harbor plan and zoning, but we've left that open. So that doesn't just create a view as you drive down, but then you just turn onto Margin Street all along there. Yeah, and then just one more point to punctuate that piece is that the, the building itself does step back as the as the building rises, so again I alluded to it with the cursor when I was pointing at the presentation. It's not a vertical street wall, fully at that edge like the building is today. Almost acts like a vertical street wall. So the the roofs slope back and creates another aperture as your eyes wander up vertically. That the aperture widens. 
Um, I have a question from a planning board member, Tom Callahan. I want to just take away my screen because it improves my uh, video uh, audio. But I, just to follow up on Chris's point, um, has anybody seen the materials he submitted you know, with questions um, that he had submitted to the board, his written comments? Uh, because on this point, what he, he's, he's pointing out that in one of your drawings, it's showing the viewscape up close from sort of a sidewalk perspective rather than a car perspective uh, and suggesting that that uh, hexagonal building, that's the portion of the building that's sticking out at the end is sticking out and blocking into the viewscape if you are driving. And I just wonder if the applicant has seen that written comment and maybe should address it point by point. He puts little boxes on a lot of your drawings with a lot of comments. It's not just this one question. Um, and at some point, you know, I would like to see his various comments uh, be addressed point by point. Um, I'd like to ask a question, which did is everybody, George. Did everybody get that? I don't, <laughs> it's hard to know if anybody heard that. No, we heard it, Tom. Okay. 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 So, um, so I guess two things. One is, um, Tom, can you forward that information that was generated by Mr. McFarlane to the uh, architects? I got it from Lauren. Um, oh, I see. Okay. She submitted public comments that she had. She gave me a set of public comments. Uh, that she had received as of June 25th. So um, yes, I would, I would love that to be made available to the applicant to address because I think, you know, in addition to the two or three questions Chris has put up tonight, he, he raises a lot of interesting points about the drawings. Um, that may be right, may be wrong, but I think we should just address it. Okay. So this is uh, this is Mark Klopfer on the team landscape architect. Yep. Um, part of part of the Zoom world is we're not sure who's supposed to answer the question. <laughs> so we have seen Chris's questions, and uh, the next session actually is looking at landscape architecture and affordable housing. And we thought that that was a better moment to go into the deep dive of of Chris's yeah. deep dive questions. So we're happy. Oh, yeah, to that, that, that's those. fine. I I wanted yeah. to just make sure you had them and that at some point in this process, not everything is going to be condensed into tonight, but at some point in the process, you look at those comments, uh, have the opportunity to review them. Yep, yep, we, we were planning on that for the next session. Yep. Okay. Um, I would like a point of, I would like to raise a point of information with George. Um, back to that slide, please, which shows the three sequences, because you're using the meeting. You're you're just you're referring to town meeting, Cohasset Harbor plan, and proposed. And when you're referring to the April 2019 town meeting, what exactly are you describing there? W what is that actual piece of information that was presented to the public? Was that the harbor plan under chapter 91? Was that the overlay that was um, described in a general way? Can you be specific in, in clarifying that for me? And then I see Eric. I think Clark might have something. And Paul, do you have something, Paul Colleri? No, okay. So George, so Eric, and then Clark. Uh, Madam Chair, the slide on the left, the April town meeting, I believe was prepared by the planning board. So maybe uh, one of the members can talk about that. Uh, th there also is language in the zoning overlay that talks about the southern edge of Elm Street as the start of the view corridor. And that's what we have, we're adhering to. So it's not just these pretty pictures with arrows, it's actually a definitive line along Elm Street that we, that's in the zoning overlay that we're adhered to. All right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Eric? So I think uh, view corridors are all well and good. I, I, I've been walking recently and I, I still get beautiful views of the of the ocean over when I go around Jerusalem and Atlantic. It's a nice walk. I think more importantly, before we start wasting time here um, with kind of design specifics, I think we should get into the, this is more directed to the planning board and maybe to George and, and Ted about the uh, the commercial space because I think that's probably the most relevant uh, uh, matter to discuss first. 
because if we don't get over that hurdle, um, whether or not you have a, uh, a, a 45 degree view into the harbor or a, a 75 degree view into the harbor, I, I think that's very much secondary and, and not irrelevant, but, but secondary all the same. Um, I'm looking at 64,000 square feet, 68,000 square feet, and 10,000, uh, around 10,000, I believe, and, and ble George or Ted, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, around 10,000 commercial. Was the 15, is a 15% requirement in the bylaw, which would put that uh, higher than the 10,000. So I, I think before we start really doing a deep dive into all this other stuff and, and even getting further down the, down the road on landscaping and views and all the other stuff that's going to go along with it, I, 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 I think if, if the parties don't agree to what the commercial space is going to be, um, all the other stuff it may be irrelevant, right? I mean, I think that's, that, that's probably the biggest issue here. But I could be wrong. Uh, okay, Erica, if you wouldn't mind, um, and Clark, if you wouldn't mind, I feel like I need to go back to the public comments uh, because that was how it was described to us is that we take those, then we go back to the planning board members. Is that all right? That's, great That's fine. We, yeah. can wrap, we can wrap up at the end. Yeah. Okay, so then um, let's go back to uh, Mr. McFarland's uh, second, third comments, and then Katie Dugan and, and Jen, will you proctor that? Sure. So um, I think we'll just streamline a little bit. So um, Mr. McFarland had a question just to outline what the 20,000 20, foot square foot park is. And, um, and there was a, a series of questions and he wanted to also know about, do you own access to the town dock to allow a retailer to provide rentals? Any opportunity for you to provide improvements to make this real? Well, and then there's can, some questions. Can, can I just interject very quickly? Uh, yeah. Just very quickly. I, I, I think that uh, the town comments, we certainly want to hear 100%. We want to hear all of them, as a matter of fact. We want as much input as possible. But I think in order to have a, 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 mm -hmm. a productive a meeting, uh, if landscape is on the board for the next meeting, I. I do believe that some of the questions that relate to landscaping should be deferred to the next public heating meeting. That's just my opinion again, because otherwise I think we go down a rabbit hole of getting distracted um, and, 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 and not really getting to the relevant points about the project itself. When we have other, um, you know, we, we have other markers for, to discuss these very matters that the citizens are gonna to wanna to ask questions about. But unless certain answers come up and certain you know uh, resolutions are made, you know those landscaping issues maybe are, are in, in in some ways are very much secondary to the more pertinent, pertinent and relevant issues at hand, um, and and they're also calendar for 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 different uh, uh, public meetings. And I'm not not to nominalize them at all because I think they're all worth hearing and, and worth being answered. But I think that's an important uh, point, you know, just to raise. Um, so Eric, in response to your comments, this presentation included multiple materials, including some discussion of landscape. Think, I think that's why the questions are coming up. I recognize the importance of the issue of retail space. That will be addressed in a later meeting. Um, but so I feel like just for this first meeting, let's try to get through the, the citizens' comments, then we'll go back to the planning board. Uh, and then we'll, if this way of sort of circulating doesn't work, then we'll find another path to be able to ensure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, uh, I agree. All right, and so this will require that we keep track of questions that really can't be answered now. So for example, the questions about uh, village retail, uh, what's going on there. We actually didn't hear anything about that. So we don't have information that can we, we can respond to. There is other in questions though here, for example, of Katie Dugan. Um, there's a comment from a person named Janet. Uh, uh, there's actually two questions about um, uh, danger and bicycles. So we can you yeah, but, deal with some questions and others we can't. So let's deal but, with the but, ones but, we can. Just not, not to interrupt you, Amy, but, but, but with all due respect, there are certain issues that have 
more, more relevance to, with regards to the project's viability than others. Um, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not, again, I want all questions answered and heard, but to spend time, perhaps hours worth of time, discussing matters that may very well be able to be heard at further meetings, when we have a rather larger issue to tackle and discuss, in my opinion, it seems like going about things a little bit backwards. Because if we don't tackle the, 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 the bigger issue out of the gates, then we all could be sitting here just kind of twiddling our thumbs a little bit. Now, I understand this, this is an initial meeting and, and, and we, want to feel, uh, we want to feel the public's comments, but there's gonna be, I would hope, I would hope there's gonna be dozens of public comments and, 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 and which could go on for hours, but there, there are certain issues that I think as the, the, as the board needs to discuss with the developer before we get into minutia and other things regarding biking and park, you know, you know, these sorts of stuff. I think it's important because we could be wasting a lot of time otherwise. I, I don't disagree with you, but the problem is, is that we don't have any information at this moment to actually respond to the retail question. The one person who I think could reiterate the, the thinking behind the scale of retail would be Clark because he, that was his specification in the overlay. But beyond that, we don't have anything on the table that we heard to respond to. And so we would be reaction, reacting without content. So I have uh, Clark, uh, okay, so this is, um, Clark, I'm gonna let you speak, Tom, I'm gonna let you speak, then I'm gonna return to the citizens. Just briefly, I mean, this is the first uh, public hearing and it's sort of the mile high, uh, broad brushstroke uh, perspective. Right. Having um, having the public um, make all any and all comments um, are, are fine, uh, provided that um, uh, that the applicant doesn't consider every their, all of their comments uh, from the public um, requirements to comply with I mean that's that's I think that's something that we, we need to um, might make sense to recommend um, so my my sense would be to um, get a few more public comments and then have Eve Tapper um, uh, and maybe our do we have our peer reviewer uh, make make uh, pr their preliminary comments and then get comments from the board for next steps and then we'll, we'll you know, maybe we'll, um, we can um, um, uh, wrap. Uh, I think that's a good recommendation because I think that the, the questions we have, some are very precise and they can feed in well and others are not quite so. And, and so we'll, we'll log them and, and then kind of keep them, um, uh, you know, in a pocket to, to review um, perhaps at a later date. Eve? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, I, Karis, you may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it's important for the board to hear the comments from the public, but I don't think that we need to, at this public hearing, answer all of those respond. questions it's, it, and respond to every one of them. It's, it's um, the, the board is, has to take those comments into consideration uh, when making your decision, uh, but there are lots of different comments and and as i said earlier i may have comments as well that the board doesn't necessarily agree with and that's okay uh because it's, so the board needs to make the determination based on specific findings but i don't think we need to be going back and forth with everybody's um everybody's questions unless there's something that the what someone in the public asked as a clarification that you might be able to give more information on that. But generally, uh, their opinions on particular things are important for the board to hear, but do not need to be continually uh, back and forth and answered. Am I yep. right, Harris? Yes, Madam Chair, that's exactly what I was raising my hand to say, which is um, the, the public comments are important. The comments that have been made into the Q&A should be recorded. Um, and then I think that perhaps Eve and Jen and Lauren can take a look at them, group them together in, uh, in uh, subject matter areas, uh, and then have 
the applicant address them at the next appropriate meeting um, and so that they become part of the record and where they're um, you know need to be addressed they can be addressed but this is really an opportunity for the board to ask their big picture questions about the project tonight thank you jen and could we just uh just for any of the um just mentioned that they can also email any questions in writing and to please do so um i've noted their questions but if we could please have people send us email us comments and questions we'll make sure that everybody gets those as well and they can do that to uh, lind at cohassetma.org jen do you want to quickly summarize the it looks like there's a grouping of the questions you want to group them just so that they get into the record and then we'll uh i'll, I'll respond to tom and then we'll um uh move on all right, so I'll just read the questions out loud um, in a row, and then um, they'll, those will go into, those will be notated, and then we can um, compile them. Does that sound good? That sounds fine. Okay, thank you. So uh, Mr. McFarland asks if it's in a short period of time, the village has lost quite a few retailers as analysis of this project considered impacts to the village. Katie Dugan, um, I would like the CHI team to address the bike path and bike circulation. The proposed project, projected project would significantly increase trips for new residents at the south, north, and west buildings. During the summer, there is significant bike traffic with children heading to Cohasset Sailing Club, Cohasset Yacht Club, um, et cetera. Um, Janet Fogarty, who lives on Elm Street, she's made a few comments about the view corridor. She thinks the plans are great, but would um, just has wanted some more clarification on that at some point. Um, and then Mr. McFarland also mentions that the, um, it's, the, the area is difficult and dangerous for children on bicycles. Has the traffic engineer made any improvements to biking? Um, let me go through and There was a question about the dock, which you already did. And then all three buildings, have, do all three buildings have underground parking? Is that from Jean Patterson? Eric has, and then um, is a traffic assessment, let's see, if in the traffic assessment, you did not address the dozens of children who ride their bikes. So there's a lot of bike questions. And that's it. Okay, so in the future, we'll work out a better way for this to go so that it, it gets, more formally compartmentalized. Let's move on. I want to respond to Tom and then um, see if there are other comments from the board. Well, my, my question first was, because I'm not familiar with Zoom, uh, is, I see 13 Q and A's down here at the moment. Can they simply be printed and compiled or, or are we taking notes and trying to reinvent the wheel here? I don't know how Zoom works and whether we can just compile these or print out these Q&As. A transcript can be generated. Okay, great. Um, okay. And I think that, you know, what we could, we, we've just heard is an overview presentation of the whole project, which is naturally going to generate Q&As all over the project. But we seem to have earlier tonight set a schedule that we're going to deal with certain topics at certain times. Um, and we should probably stick to that and compile these questions as they come in. Are they coming during the week, coming at a meeting like this, and get them to the applicant in advance of the next hearing on that particular topic and let them respond to them, hopefully before the meeting, so we have some meaningful responses in front of us and we can all read them into the record and discuss them on the record as we need to. But as long as they can be transcribed, that's great. I wasn't aware that that was a capability. I do, I do want to just say something in support of Eric that this is a mixed use project. And if I read the bylaw correctly, there is a certain requirement of a certain amount of commercial space. And I think his point is well taken that that has to be one of the threshold issues because how it's resolved may impact so many other aspects of the design of this project. Um, so whether we, you know, again, tonight seemed to be an introductory and overview session, but um, I think certainly for the next session, we need to move that up to the forefront. I agree with Eric, it's not the only issue, but it is a very important issue 
in how this project gets designed. Uh, so thanks for that comment. And um, I, I will work with Jen, Eve, and Lauren, uh, and I think they can do this themselves actually, to figure out the order of the, the content so that we address this issue in the next meeting. Is that all right? That's what, that's what I was really, Amy, that's what I was getting at really. I, I think it's very important to prioritize the issues that we discussed. I think that every citizen should be heard and, and should be entitled to get their questions answered without without a doubt. But there are some issues that are just the way it works. It's a higher priority than the next, right? So if, if you don't address a high priority issue, you, you won't get down to the third or fourth issue because uh, it, that's just not the way it works. So I think that in order to make this productive, move things along the way in which we should, we should certainly field all the citizens' questions uh, at, at the relevant time and, and at the proper meeting. Um, I think the introduction was great, and I, and I think that that was a, a great start, this whole process. But I think that there should be focus on what are the big issues here, what are the priorities, and you know go down the line. And as we go down that line, address the questions that citizens may have um, and, and answer them accordingly. So I don't disagree with you, though I think this is going to be an iterative process, and I think we're going to have certain issues that end up converging and then diverging, and, and we're going to have to address them at multiple times. But he, listening to you and agreeing with you, we will work to reorganize the lineup of topics so that it, it gets some of the more salient and difficult questions up front. Uh, Lauren? Thank you. I'd just like to add that I'd be happy to work with additional time staff on ways that we can organize this best and even creating some sort of an FAQ sheet for questions that repeatedly come up. I can put together something like that. I think that would be helpful for everyone. That's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, um, so I want to circle back now. We've basically covered the questions. We will either, uh, these will get forwarded to the, the uh, developer and uh, we will also keep a log of them and we'll sort them so that they can be accessible uh, as we go through the project. I'd now like to ask the planning board members if they have uh, some comments and we might be thinking of wrapping up at this point. Yep. Clark. Clark. Clark here. Thank you. Um, I have uh, some uh, mile high uh, comments. Uh, one is on the view corridor. Um, the the um, diagram that George referenced that was on the left side of the slide is exactly what was presented to uh, the floor of town meeting. Uh, unfortunately, in the, um, the applicant's um, landscape plan, they're, they're showing a kiosk, which it, it, it is to the uh, north um, of the street, uh, but I think it will fall in the view corridor. The, uh, the goal for the view corridor was uh, that uh, from that line of Elm Street, uh, where the street hits the sidewalk, all the way to the north, that that, that be open. Uh, now, if you have something like a, a kayak rental rack that's, that's, um, that's see-through, I think that's probably uh, something reasonable, but, but what looks like a, a, a 10 by 20 foot uh, box um, I don't think that was what we were um, thinking, but I, I would like to see the, the layout, the engineering geometry of the, um, of the sidewalk line on Elm Street, not, not margin sidewalk, but Elm Street uh, and uh, how, it, um, how it intersects with the site uh, by, the, by the applicant. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the uh, number two is, the, the, this initial pr presentation was was excellent. I, I think it was thorough, uh, compelling. It told a story. Uh, but what I'd like to uh, I would like to make sure of is that uh, that the applicant send all of his um, presentation materials to the planning board for inclusion in the public record. Will do. Okay, great. Um, uh, a, th a third thing is uh, the connection to the village. I think the triangle, the triangle and the Elm Street corridor need to be redesigned. 
There's a landscape architect that has worked on that. I've worked on that. I think that there's uh, some other uh, team members. And the, the goal is to have a stakeholder meeting to review what could be done and what, what might make sense in conjunction with this project and some town infrastructure changes that are going to be happening in the in the uh, in the in the foreseeable future i just think that lauren i'd ask lauren to uh prioritize getting uh getting that moving um uh with uh with some uh face time on on all the stakeholders <clears throat> uh the fourth thing i have in my uh in my notes is um the the balconies this is a detail, but the balconies look like they're um, glass that goes down to the floor. So you can see the whole door um, if somebody's uh, in their bathrobe and, and looking out the, um, uh, the, the, the great view. I, I just think it, it probably makes sense to, to toggle the, the privacy of that uh, balcony, uh, you know, the, the railing down. Uh, to a, a 50 to 80 percent uh, transparency, maybe not 100 percent solid, but a 50 to 80 percent, not the what looks like 100 percent glass. I just think that's that could be too much information, and um, people need a certain amount of privacy. Um, and then the last thing is for next time, I'd like to see uh, a specific breakdown of percentages of the commercial space including uh, seasonal kiosks and uh, the allowable 5% um, of the 15% of flexible outdoor space, uh, dining, seating, that kind of thing. I'd I like to uh, just to have you confirm the uh, precise exact numbers so that Eric doesn't have to kind of go through um, the, the numbers in his head. Uh, I just think that's gonna be important for next time. Those are all my comments. Those are all my comments. <clears throat> Amy, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, would anyone else like to speak from the planning board? Uh, Eric? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be pretty straightforward. I, I don't agree with the, uh, uh, the necessarily, I don't necessarily agree with the uh, site plan review and special permit that was, uh, that states that uh, 22,750 square feet of uh, the project is going to be uh, for publicly accessible ground floor commercial and non-residential use, which would equal 34.6%. So I'll, 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 just to be candid here, I think that the importance uh, for me, uh, what I would place, place as number one priority is not meeting a 15% requirement, because I also think that that's unrealistic if you know anything about village uh, commerce, uh, but also uh, perhaps focusing on uh, ways in which that there can be guarantees that this is this will be a harbor that is for all the people and not a harbor that 10 years from now is just for the residents of uh, of the condominium and that can be done in, in a variety of ways it can be done as you're as you're proposing uh, to a certain degree uh, it can be done via re deed restrictions or 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 exclusive easements and, and it can be done you know a number of ways but I would like to see that be focused on a little bit and perhaps as that's one of the larger uh, issues to tackle, especially considering that the bylaw does require a minimum of 15% and we would have to uh, uh, come to an agreement on that. Uh, I think that that is something that we should tackle first uh, before we get into the minutia. And other than that, uh, you know, I think you guys did a great job tonight and I think it's going to be something that is going to benefit the town and, and really be a, a beneficial uh, uh, addition for everyone. But that is something that we definitely need to address because uh, absent addressing that, what the lighting is or what the uh, bike use is, is really secondary in my opinion. Thank you for those comments. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Um, Tom, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's, so, there's so much to uh, wrap your head around here. I'm trying to think in my own way of doing things, how I organize my thoughts. Um, 
Now, Amy, you mentioned we didn't have some materials submitted about the, the, the percentage of commercial space, but you know, we received a 13 page letter from attorney Brodsky. That Can you outlays, please speak into the mic? I'm sorry, I'm trying. Uh, we have a 13 page letter from attorney Brodsky that covers all kinds of topics, including the commercial space. So I think we do have information that is being submitted that we can comment on. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what's the best forum and way for me to, I mean, I've been making notes and I have extensive comments about lots of different aspects of this project. But um, you know, as part of the overview tonight, um, I, I was concerned about the site ownership because I think it's important that we do know who we're dealing with. The current property owner is not the applicant. Uh, and if there's no objection, I was given a copy of a letter from attorney Havener to attorney Brodsky that I assume was given to planning staff. That's where I got it. That outlines the whole issue about site ownership. And I'd like to submit that to the record if we can. Um, as far as going forward, I guess I have a question for Karis. I mean, my, my personal style would be to put a lot of comments in writing uh, for the record. And um, I would like to see if that's okay as a way of doing it, submitting it on the record that people from the public can see my comments um, and then submitting it to the applicant for responses again. So hopefully when we go to the next meeting, that's not asking questions for the first time that night and you know, getting an off the cuff answer, but perhaps a detailed thought out answer. Um, it's just that this forum with Zoom is different and I just want to know what's the best way to, you know, to approach organizing my thoughts and comments as we go forward. Harris, is ownership uh, relevant? It, 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 it is relevant, yeah. Eric. Well, why relevant. is that? So, so why Eric, hang on, hang on, hang on, guys. Let's just, can I, can I answer the question before you, you start in a debate? Um, it, site control is, is what's relevant, not ownership. And, and there is sufficient evidence of site control to move forward with the application. That's my legal opinion and that's my advice to the board. Um, if you want to have a separate conversation about that with me thereafter, I'm happy to do that offline. I don't wanna do that in a public meeting, um, but that's my advice in my opinion is that there's sufficient information in the record at this point uh, to go forward with respect to site control. I, and I don't disagree with that. I just that the letter that outlines that evidence i just i didn't know i don't think it's part of the application materials the application materials show us that we have a site owner and we have a site applicant and if you look up those records it's just a sea of llc's upon llc's not that there's anything wrong with that that's a common development organizational tool i just wanted in the record the letter that actually lays it all out so that there is no question. I agree that site control is the issue and this letter lays it all out for us. It should be part of the record. Okay, so my understanding is that the issue at hand is to ensure that all documents that come and are used to inform us of this project, two things have to happen. One, we need to get everything in advance. It, we need to see slides with 48 hours of advanced um, uh, receipt so that we have a chance to examine them. Number two, if people wish to submit something to the record, that needs to be set and, and it is expected to inform the discussion so that we do not have to discuss it potentially. That also has to be in the record so that all the planning board members and the relevant parties can review that material. That's the only way we will not end up lost in lacking information on particular topics. So that's, that would be my recommendation is that we establish a rule that basically says information has to be in by a certain period of time so that we can review it before we see the, the next chapter of the project. Um, uh, I have a question from the, uh, uh, oh, you just moved around. So um, please go ahead. <laughs> not, uh, I, I, you, your name is not coming up. Okay, Darren. Darren. Yeah, oh, sorry, it, it's Darren. Um, I'm from Weston and Samson. I just 
I know uh, Lauren had introduced us as a peer reviewer. I just want to, I think what may be helpful is when, you know, as we're doing the peer review and putting that file together by topic, stormwater, um, chapter 91, uh, different traffic and um, other site civil act, um, uh, items that we've reviewed, that may be helpful for the discussion we're planning to provide that, um, not by the next meeting, but um, we were planning by well before that August 5th meeting. So just wanted to provide that if that's helpful to the board. Any, in, any information that we are expected to include in our deliberations needs to be to us so we have time to digest it. And I think Lauren yes, and yes. Jen and Eve can figure out uh, what uh, the right time frame is so that everyone feels like they're informed and not pressed. That's right. Other comments from the board? <clears throat> Amy, if I may. Uh, I yes, Paul. I don't know if it worked. Uh, congratulations um, on your new position. I think you did a great job. And uh, thank you for leading us forward through these uh, times ahead. George and Ted, I think you guys did a great job with your presentation tonight. Thank you. And um, I think collectively the whole town is looking forward to working with you guys and getting this project uh, underway finally. And I just wanted to uh, say thank you again to Clark for his leadership since I've been involved and in, uh, just grateful to be here and part of the team. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's very nice. Nice sign off. Um, it is 935. Uh, if, is, are there any further comments from members of the board or um, our uh, professional staff? Uh, Eve, I notice. Okay, so I, I just, um, I, I wanted to recommend to the board when you're coming up with your questions uh, to, to give the, it, it helps to give the applicant um, sort of a goal to meet. The, if you're talking about the viewscape, instead of talking about the details of how you'd like to see the viewscape, give the, you could give the applicants what you think the goal should be and let them do the design um, because they do on the site. And uh, I know everyone on the board and, and in the public um, have some expertise in a lot of these areas, but ultimately the applicant has to be willing to make those um, changes. So you know, whether there should be enough commercial and those kinds of questions are, are right. Um, but if we can not have quite so, and not that you did this today, but I think it makes it easy if you can ask general questions and tell them what your goals are and let them try to meet those goals. I think that might be a good way to have some iteration um, going forward. Thank you. I think that's a good recommendation, Eric. Yeah, so I'm looking at the calendar here, and July 8th was site plan layout on public ground traffic and circulation, which some of the citizens did ask questions about traffic and circulation. As a, as a board, we didn't address that at all. Uh, I would propose that we take a look at the, the, the schedule of topics and perhaps uh, reorganize these based upon priority so that George and Ted and the rest of his group can focus upon what the priority topics are, tackle those, and move down the list. Um, and at, preferably, when you get closer to the end, you're just dealing with uh, you know belt suspenders. Uh, we haven't talked about traffic and circulation on, at this meeting, so presumably that gets moved to July 15th, which is just affordable housing. August 5th is follow up on items flagged in previous meetings, which I, I believe that there's a lot of different things to talk about. So. I mean, my proposal would be that we need a, a, just a general meeting about conformity with the bylaw and our thoughts and feelings about that. And if there's not conformity with it, how can we work with the developer to make a project that works? And, and once we get past that, we can get into the, again, the traffic and circulation, the landscape, the lighting, all that great stuff, you know, like what that's gonna make it beautiful and, and, a, and, and a successful project. But absent having that conversation, which is not really addressed. I don't know when we're going to do that and, and how are we going to do that? And I, that's how I would think that we should proceed is, is doing a priority top down, getting over each hurdle before George and Ted even waste any more time 
dealing with addressing our questions on affordable housing and, 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 and landscape and lighting and, and, and design and all that other stuff. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe that uh, if one or both of the memos that Eve prepared for the board started to address some of those questions. Um, and I think that it is probably incumbent upon uh, the staff and um, the experts to take a look at those questions in the context of the application and review them for the board and be prepared to talk about them at the next meeting. I think that's a, a reasonable expectation uh, for the next meeting and that really falls into sort of site plan layout and public realm uh, and then perhaps um, you might want to start getting into more detail on traffic once we finish that piece and bump the architecture landscape affordable housing down to August 5th as a suggestion on uh, sort of how to how the how these meetings would flow and then um, to the extent Tom I didn't get a chance to answer your question about written comments uh, then then you would know that your written comments uh, for next week would focus on site plan layout, bylaw compliance, and potentially traffic and circulation, and other board members would know that as well. Does that uh, make sense in terms of, of uh, a proposed structure that um, allows the, the process to go forward uh, and gets over that sort of initial hurdle of bylaw compliance? So I'd like to make a comment. I think that um, uh, Ms. North has um, uh, offered us an interesting way forward. I would raise the following question, which relates to what Eric says. We do not have a market analysis to tell us whether or not retail will work. So we don't have the information that we would need to be able to decide one way or the other. And if we need that information and the master plan does not have anything that we can pull a tiny bit out of that, but it's not gonna make any sense. So if what becomes a key ingredient is, can we make retail work at a smaller scale? Can we make it a larger scale? We don't have that information. That's not a critique, it's just a statement of fact. And of George and 10 of the developers, 12,000 square feet of commercial space is not going to work down there. So. But what they're proposing is interesting because that's why you could do it in different ways. You could do it via, you know, restrict public use. You could do it via kiosk. You could do it, you know, just to just to give the public the sense. Because the biggest thing that's going to happen ten years from now is people are going to come up to you and say, "Hey, geez, Eric, uh, you really uh, you really made a bad decision there because that's all. Those are all private residences, and we can't even walk on that waterfront." Right? That's what's going to happen 10 years from now if the planning board does not adequately address that issue. And I think they've made a great effort towards it. And I actually think they made a realistic, realistic effort towards it. But I think that's got to be the first discussion because it, it, this all goes towards being able to access and use the waterfront as a community. And everything else really can fall into line. That's my opinion. But you know, I think long term, that's that's really what everyone's going to come back on 10 years from now. And they're going to ask every, all of us. They're going to ask George. They're going to ask Ted. They're going to ask Amy. They're going to ask everyone who lives in town. You know, if it's if it's not accessible to the citizens and, and able to be used to a certain degree, it's it, that's something that's going to be a problem down the line. So I think that's the first discussion and maybe one of the most important. I don't disagree with you, by the way. I uh, myself feel that we do not have enough information about what could happen. I think that the, I agree with you that the developer has done a good job of s sketching out possibilities, but we don't have the uh, uh, economic analysis to know what could or couldn't work. In lieu of that, what you recommended is that you place certain kinds of constraints on the property going into perpetuity so that there will always be something. And I'm not sure that's the right answer either. I would, what I would like to do is to pitch this to Eve and Lauren to um, uh, you know, work with me to figure out how we could bring something together that would be information useful for the board to understand better what the, what the scale question really is because the scale question is at, at the core. And I would also say that since Clark was the person who designed the overlay, it would be important for him to be a part of that conversation as well. Uh, I recognize Tom. 
Yeah, if I, if I could just ask either George or Adam a question, just so I understand your application, because in, in Adam's letter, there's no request for any waiver from the you know, minimum non-residential percentage requirement. So in, in a quick nutshell, what is making up the 15% that the bylaw requires in this proposal? Because certainly the square footage in the buildings isn't adding up. Adam can answer. Oh, thank, thank you very much, George. And thank you, Mr. Callahan. Again, the requirement uh, is that if we're proposing dwelling units on the ground floors of the buildings, that we're required to provide a minimum of 15% of the building areas dedicated to publicly accessible ground floor commercial or non-residential, excluding parking uses, including seasonal commercial uses. And we actually provided a graphic depiction of our calculations. It's a sheet, I believe, three of the plan set submitted to the planning board prepared by Cavanaro Consulting. That's correct. It's the ground area ratio plan, sheet three of seven, which provides uh, our calculations based upon our reading of the bylaw. And again, the, the bylaw is not limited simply to retail. In my introductory remarks, I gave a very shorthand explanation as to why we conform to that requirement. It's a much more complicated and nuanced calculation, uh, but you have our graphic depiction with all of the square footages uh, as to what is required and what is proposed on sheet three of seven. Right, so I, I just want to be clear about that. So outside space, such as the park and the terraces, et cetera, is included in that and it's not just straight retail space inside of a building. Correct, because the bylaw speaks to commercial or non-residential uses, including seasonal commercial uses. That's correct. It, it also says in the next sentence of the 15% minimum, a maximum of 5% may be dedicated to outdoor seasonal use, such as outdoor eating area or for seasonal temporary uh, uses and also you can use some of that setback. So if you have to look at uh, you know, every sentence in that particular section to, to go through the calculation and, and understand uh, well, I mean, what the requirement is. I understand that. It seems, it seems though to me, just at first glance, that the majority of the um, requirement is being met by outdoor space rather than indoor retail space. And I, I you know, I, I admit to not being part of all the harder discussions and the dis nuances of this bylaw, but uh, when one talks about mixed use, I don't think one contemplates a park as being mixed use. I think one contemplates an actual commercial use, but we'll get into that later. But I'm just, you know, just as an initial comment, I just wanted to be clear on what the, uh, how the compliance with that requirement is being met. Now I understand what they're proposing, so. And, and I just had two additional points and I'm happy to discuss this and provide more information. It's a reference to 5% of the total building area. Um, uh, and I, I do want to note that the bylaw does allow us to seek a waiver if uh, the planning board uh, thinks it's appropriate to have, you know, a uh, 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 less commercial I, un space. I understand that, but you weren't asking for a waiver. That's why we I have not. Qualify, so. Correct. All right. All right. Um, thank you for that, Eve. Thank you. I just also wanted to add um, in the harbor overlay uh, section 22.5 in the uses. Uh, number one is dwelling units in a multi-family format in combination with one or more of the uses below. So it has to have, you know, so stores or retail uses, restaurants, personal service establishments, offices. So that doesn't have anything to do with the percentage, but they can't just have a multifamily use and the open space. There does have to be some type of additional use. Um, and because one of the purposes in the very front of the overlay zone talks about um, that it's a mixed use development and, um, and having some commercial uses in public access to the harbor is a fundamental purpose of the, of the overlay zone. So. Uh, you, you're not going to, I'm not talking about the percentages per se, but it does have to be a mix of uses other than just uh, open space, which they are providing, but um, you may or may not like the percentages. 
All right, Eric. Yeah, I, I, I just would point out. Just so I don't want to waste wait, the rest wait, of my life. Uh, Eric? Uh, I want to just want to. First of all, Adam is a fantastic attorney, and I, I I've known him for quite a long time, and he's a he's a wonderful person. So you have a great team in place, uh, and, a, and one of the best attorneys I, I've ever known. But uh, uh, with regards to uh, the 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 commercial space, this is my opinion as a planning board member. I, I think the fifteen percent is is crazy. That's my opinion as a planning board member. And I, I understand the language allows us to move on that. I think 2427 interior, I think that's something to work on, right? I, I, I just, I, I feel like the, the public and, and, and as a planning board, that's something that could be, some, uh, could be an issue down the line. I think realistically, you know, we're not uh, 12,000 square feet of commercial space is, it would never happen on the, uh, considering the seasonal use that we are here, that we use here in Cohasset. But it's something to, to, to take into consideration maybe for the next meeting so that we can have a game plan in place, maybe to, you know, have a, a, a serious discussion on how we can come to an agreement. All right. Thank you for that, Eric. Tom? Uh, nothing else. All right. Nothing else for now. Okay. So here's what I would say. We uh, are lacking in certain respects the information that we need to even offer options. But I believe that between the, the planners and the staff in town, we can take a stab at coming up with something that can frame a discussion around this issue. I personally agree that the, uh, this, this core, which is the core for accessing and, and realizing the public benefit of the space uh, is underdetermined. And we need to see if we can get more information um, on that as a result. I could turn to the developer and ask if you can help us figure that out um, or, or if you would like to add more specification uh, to the situation because um, at this point what I'm hearing is it can't be a public park. It, it could be oversized. Uh, it, it, um, it is underspecified in terms of what that's going to mean for the project and in lacking that information, it's going to tie us up going forward. That's what I hear. George? So in regards to the zoning overlay, we believe we've met and exceeded the 15%. Uh, it's explained in Adam's brief. He just explained it again. And we certainly can take it up and talk about it at future meetings or, or with staff between now and the meetings. Um, we have a similar concern and have all along about creating a significant amount of bricks and mortar retail space that may go vacant because of the seasonality of it. So we feel that we've met the bylaw and in addition have created a significantly more public space than is required. The comment about the public space not being there forever is simple to resolve in a number of legal, as Eric knows, uh, it, uh, that is very simple to resolve and that's the intention. So that's not an issue for us. In fact, everything in the 14 questions that you can, I, we can actually pull up the questions by just clicking on it. Um, we can address all of them if they haven't been addressed. Uh, for example, the, the bike safety that both Katie's uh, mentioned uh, is very significant to us and that's why we're creating this additional and large walkway around the, the water so they don't have to go down Marge Street and around the dangerous corner of Elm Street over to Summer and Border Street. So we're actually improving significantly the bike uh, and pedestrian walkway along that part of town. Um, I'm more than happy to reach out as we've done all along to the abutters and neighbors and residents of the town to answer the questions. I actually know Katie's, both Katie's very well, so I will reach out to them tomorrow and go through the plan with them and we're willing to do that obviously with anybody. So uh, I agree with what's been said tonight in terms of answering the questions. We uh, will do it in whichever manner you guys want us to and we're ready and available to do that. You're, you're still muted, Amy. Clark? I thought he wanted to say something. Lauren? No. Nope. Oh, Clark? Okay. Yeah, no, no comment. 
Oh, okay, fine. Lauren? Thank you. I've been listening to the conversation here and looking at our schedule and redlining up a storm. And my question to the board is originally we were planning to continue and meet um, a week from tonight with that and all of the information that we need, um, all the information the board is looking for, the back and forth with peer review and getting information people in time. I'm wondering if we want to continue on August 5th instead. That way we would that we could address regular planning board and material on the 15th, we would still have a meeting, and August 5th we could follow up on bylaw compliance, follow up on site plan, traffic and circulation in more detail, and talk about commercial space. That, we, that would give us time to have our full peer review, um, and we could ha begin to have the response from the applicant as well, and would give more time for everybody to digest all of this. So I pose that to the board to consider. I personally think that's a good solution. I don't think that in a week's time or in two weeks time, we're gonna be completely prepared. So this would make uh, a, a better gesture to being able to address the issues. I'll share my screen of what this current red line looks like so you can get a better idea. Oh, it's in the wrong part of my screen. Sorry, hold on, give it one minute please. Oops, no, nope, don't want to use that. <clears throat> Give me a moment, please. About this project? Okay. I don't know if anybody heard that. Yeah. All right. Is the, is the idea, Lauren, that on August 5th, this would be the only matter we would be discussing? We would be devoting the whole two, three hours to this project? Yes, we can arrange for that. Okay. Well, with the exception that we did continue a hearing earlier to 6.45, um, noting that that is subject to further discussion that may we may consider requesting a withdrawal for that applicant, um, depending on what, what their plan is. But other than that continuation that we've stated, this would be the topics. Is there a way for us yeah, to move that meeting that we uh, continued? Because it does seem like um, that front end of the meeting today took a lot of our time. So if we could have a day where we just focus on this, I think it would be a lot more effective. Um, what, what I'm seeing for the fifth is we would have that. It might get continued a fifth or sixth time. It would take, I don't know how long it would take, um, but I'm hearing that it's the possible possibility we would have from seven o'clock until 9.30 just to deal with this project. Can we, can we ask George or, or Ted for their input? I, I presume you guys have been down this, this road before. this highway <laughs> with so many things running around. Yes, it, yeah, obviously this is a very complicated project. Obviously it's a very important project for the town. Um, so we will do obviously whatever the board wants us to do. A lot of the questions that came up at the end of this conversation tonight about compliance, about public realm, even the bicycles, we, we have studied those and we can, when asked and given the chance, we can give answers to. I think the, the commercial space issue is probably the way that you as uh, Tom and Eric are attorneys and, and Adam are attorneys. That's probably something that you guys can sit and bicker over for the rest of your lives, how, how it works. Um, I think Amy's concept about looking at a study for the retail is very uh, probably a good way to look at it too. And we already have spoken with a number of commercial brokers about it. And uh, I will tell you now, but we'll go into more detail that None of them think that uh, it's sustainable for really any retail down there. Uh, we disagree. Um, that's where we came up with the idea of the seasonal kiosks, which by the way, don't have to be retail kiosks. They could be CSCR showing off what they've done on the Gulf River for the summer. And they could be CMI um, having a, selling t-shirts and raising money. So they don't have to be the standard retail that we're all used to. And obviously the last three, four months have retail has taken on a different connotation. Um, so I, I will tell you overall, we feel that the public access and the public park is so much more important to 
us and to everybody in town that we've talked to. I mean, again, we didn't design this in a bubble. We've been talking to people for two years about this. And I think the neighbors are going to weigh in heavily about the commercial space. Um, I believe they already have. I think there's been a number of letters uh, that came in the package that, that talk about it. So I think that's the only issue that we can probably have a, uh, different opinions on, but I also believe we can come to a consensus on it. All the other things we're, we're willing to talk about and can, um, and can address and answer. And that's the one that's going to require us to come to an agreement. All the other, because that's a bylaw a concession that we're going to have to make. Off the bylaw, we have the right to agree to bend on that 15%, but as the bylaw states, it's 50 So that's what I'm saying. I, I think that if we get over that hurdle, now we have a smoother path towards success. You know, because whereas if we tackle that at the end and everything blows up, you know, it's all for naught. It, it, it's basically where well, my position on things. And I, and I do think that uh, I actually agree with you on, on a lot of what you're saying about commercial space, commercial use down there, you know, it, it being where it is. But you know, I think it's important because I think once you get past that, a lot of the other stuff aside from parking and maybe traffic, you know, is stuff that everybody can reasonably work through. Uh, okay, so it's, if we move our next meeting to August 5th, that gives us a little bit of time to try to sort this issue, this key issue out, and it's got the pieces around it that I think are going to also take more time in a discussion. Um, I would ask that Eve and Lauren and myself and Clark and the, the developer, uh, figure out a way to address this in, a, in the public hearing so that the public feels secure, that they understand what's being done. And if a trade-off is going to take place, it's really obvious why we're doing it. We don't want to end up with a situation in which people feel like we were vague or we were inexact and that produced an outcome that they weren't satisfied with. And I agree with George. I think that's, that a positive outcome can happen, but I think we have an absence of information. And I think we also haven't moved anything around yet, right? I mean, we've got a we've got a design, but you know, a lot of the time projects designs change. But let's just take up the question of um, the fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. And I and I've asked that uh, Lauren and um, Eve and Clark, myself, uh, George, or his. Um, uh, 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 representative uh, get together and talk about this in a manner that gets us forward. I don't know how else we can do it. And we might actually, would we have too many people from the board? I think not. Well, just ask me, I've been down in the village for nine years now. It's, yeah, it's Madam Chair, you'd have to, to a business. You, you'd have to leave it to two uh, board members. Right. Um, and I would just note if uh, the applicant's going to bring their counsel, um, you should probably have your counsel there as well. Uh, so, oh. um, which is fine. Adam and I can, you know, work with you on uh, uh, that particular piece um, if you have questions or issues and, and about what the bylaw means. So feel free. <clears throat> All right. So how, do, how does everybody feel about that at this moment at 10.02 p.m.? Right. Why don't we make a motion to continue to the the fifth of August at a time okay. certain? Uh, thank you for that. Um, would you like? To, can I codify that and say that's a motion? Yeah. What time? Six thirty as planned. Right. My concern, Madam Chair, is that August fifth we have. Um, continued 8 James Lane and 2 Pleasant Street to 645. Not necessarily mean that we need to start that on time. It just would likely go very late if it does continue. Those, um, those two, uh, you could uh, reconsider that continuance and continue them to a different date and time if you wanted to. Um, you, could, you could take up a motion to reconsider that. That's a good baby. suggestion. I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest baby on this list when it comes to, to meetings. Uh, so even I could do a couple meetings in August. I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And, I, and I'm usually the one that's always planning. 
So is, is the reason why we're not saying July 15th to, con to, to reconsider continuing James Lane to July 15th? Is, that, is there a reason that we're not thinking of that? And is, I mean, we're gonna be asked to do 580 Jerusalem Road. That's gonna come in too. So I've, we've given up on the, on the new schedule, we've given up July 15th. Could we schedule James Lane and the 580 that time? We don't have enough time for advertising requirements for the new large home review, um, but that can be, since it hasn't been scheduled, we can, we can uh, Wait, navigate that. that. Well. Yes, we, we just need to continue at James Lane and Two Pleasant Street, but as um, Karis just suggested, if the board would wish to reconsider, we can, re we can continue that to July 15th, and I can have a word with the applicant on how, um, how to proceed from there, and then we would dedicate the 5th to this 124.87 Elm Street application. I, I would like to ask somebody to make a motion to please do this. So moved. Seconded. All in favor, please say your name. Paul Aye. Reed, aye. Eric, Eric Potter, aye. Clark Brewer, aye. Go ahead, aye. Amy Glassmeyer, aye. Uh, motion passes. All right, so we have uh, uh, reestablished the July 15th. We've moved, ja we've moved uh, James Lane to that date. Lauren will speak with the owner about uh, the, the suitability of that time. We will uh, leave completely to itself August 5th for the continuance of the discussion of the Harbor Business Overlay Review. Can I just interject again? And there'll yeah. probably be a theme here where you, you, you hear my voice too much. So, but <laughs> I have two young kids in town, so I'm going to be around for a while. Uh, is there any way to throw another meeting in August? Because you know for a fact what's going to happen at the August 5th meeting. Everyone's going to talk for two hours about commercial space, and that's going to be that's going to take care of that that whole meeting. You know for a fact it's going to happen. Okay, so what you're asking, Eric, is, is that we need to schedule another meeting in August. We only have one right now, so I would say we could probably do two. Well, what we can do is schedule a meeting, but if it turns out that people are going to be out of town, then we'll have to cancel it. Could I suggest that given the questions and follow-up from this meeting and needing the time, um, you know, once a month may make more sense. Um, because there may be additional follow-up and analysis needed. Uh, so you come back in September and then maybe once all that analysis is done, you schedule twice in September and then maybe you schedule twice in October uh, to, to get done. August is a tough month. Um, so you may not, you may need time. Just a thought. Can we ask the developer? He seems ready to rock and roll. That's because I can't leave town, right? No place to go. Uh, Again, we're we're fine with uh, more meetings. We're fine with less meetings. For example, if you wanted to use the July fifteenth just for traffic, because uh, we can address that in a half hour, an hour, maximum, um, and or more of the site plan. So we're willing to do that. Um, so well that thank you very much that will be that what's helpful to give us space i don't think eric we have to answer this question now to have another well, meeting I, I agree. but I agree. what i would say is that i think bylaw compliance commercial space um uh, site plan layout in public realm and then traffic and circulation it should be in that order because i think commercial space and bylaw compliance are connected right All right, so we have, um, uh, we don't need to do any more motions. We've agreed to uh, move things around and uh, leave a meeting August 5th for the project. I believe our business is done this evening. Madam Anybody? Chair? Yes. Eve? Sorry, I just wanted to say one thing. We, we have, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we start listening um, at the moment, but Darren from Weston Sampson um, has done some of the analysis of the bylaw 
um, and and um, is part of their peer review. And that part was done. And originally, we had hoped that we would get to uh, be able to hear what they have gotten to so far, so they could let the developer know uh, the kinds of issues that, that they're seeing. We're, we're obviously not going to do that, but I don't think we necessarily are starting from scratch um, going forward when, when you're asking staff to do this. I think Darren has some of that information already um, in his pocket, and we can have a conversation with him about how he uh, sees the same kind of conversation that we've been having. He just didn't get a chance to speak today. All right, so then we'll, we'll put together a, a Zoom meeting of the relevant parties to discuss the materials that we have at hand. I think that's a good idea because then we'll be able to see things that we might not right now have identified, but we will based on the conversation that we have, and that might help us for the August 5th meeting. Sorry, you all look like you're ready to pop. <laughs> Sorry, but we should laugh sometimes. Okay, I, I, I so, think that's right. Uh, you know, it's just like, it's so weird. It's like all these televisions. I don't know who to look at. Oh my God. Okay, so that's it. Um, thank you very much. I believe we um, are in a situation where the meeting could come to an end. Would somebody like a motion to adjourn? You, well, you need a motion to continue first, right? Oh, right. We, Sorry, we do. We did. I thought we did that. Okay, we uh, need a motion to continue the public hearing on the Harbor Plan business overlay. Do I see a, a motion? So moved. Seconded. Please say, state your name and vote. And, and I'm sorry, that uh, that needs to be continued to a specific date and time. Oh, so, so it's like the date and time is August 5th at uh, 6.30 p.m. Do we need another second? Uh, yeah, let's roll it back and say we. I have a second. Eric, would you like to re-second? He waved his hand. Um, I second. Yeah, I second. Okay. Um, uh, call for the question, everybody. Um, Paul Grady. Aye. Eric Potter. Aye. Clark Brewer. Aye. Amy Glassmeyer. Aye. Hey, uh, Tom Callahan. Hi. The uh, motion passes. Jen? I'm sorry, I, I guess maybe I blacked out, but did we continue? Um, did we re reconsider the vote for A. James Lane? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. That did get voted. I'm going to have to get better at this stuff. This is hard. <laughs> You're doing a great job for your first time around. I mean, geez. <laughs> I'm no, I'm going to go upstairs and cry. No. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think we're done. Are we done? We're done. So we file a motion to adjourn? Yes. We just didn't. Oh, okay. Bye. Now Bye, guys. Have a, good, have a good week. Okay. Like, yeah. I'd like to have someone make an motion to adjourn. Motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Aye. Right. Uh, everyone, please call out their name and vote. Paul Eric Grady, aye. Tom? Callahan, aye. Eric? You got me, aye. Clark Brewer? Clark Brewer, aye. Amy Glassmeyer, aye. The motion passes, let's uh, close it up. Thank you very much. Bye, Amy. Thank, Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Bye.